Okay, so we are recording now. It is Wednesday, May 27th, 2020. This is the Amherst Conservation Committee meeting. Um, so I'm just pulling up my agenda, which I had open before. Um, but to start off, there's no comments for me. Um, so Dave is not here yet, so we'll have to wait for him. So Aaron, do you have, do you want to start going through your stuff? Sure. Let me just get it queued up here and then I'll share. Okay. Can you hear anything? <laughs> Nothing happening here. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> My kid's outside screaming, so, um, and yeah. I've got neighbors moving out right next door testing uh, smoke detectors and whatnot, so, nice. yeah, this is That's life. My toddler's screaming upstairs, Aaron, you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just give you guys a quick, some quick updates. Um, the first is that we just got the last today we just got the last um, ID from Laura to do um, the notarization of our e-signatures for uh, the, the um, document that needs um, a notarization for our e-signatures. So now that we have that, I forwarded it to the town clerk literally like 20 minutes ago. Um, then once that's recorded, notarized, I can take it to have it recorded at the registry and then um, we'll be all set. But it was voted in, so I think we're okay to proceed with voting on things and that everything moving forward will um, be okay. It's just that official process is still underway. Um, uh, did they decide on how we're going to actually do the e-signatures? Mm -hmm. Are we going to, are they going to do DocuSign? Are they going to do something else or to be determined? <clears throat> That's still to be determined. Um, I think from what I understand on the DEP end of things, it's as simple as just putting um, a note to the effect of e-signatures. And then what I might do is um, uh, attach the notarized document that we are um, authorizing e-signatures for the commission. Uh, for permits, but I'll, I'll speak to the registry and I'll also speak to Dave Zomek um, and see what other boards and committees are doing. Okay, and just so you know, uh, Dave is on at this point. Oh, good, okay. Actually, maybe, um, Dave, do you know what other boards and committees are doing as far as um, e-signatures on permits? Um, if we're doing like a DocuSign or if we're just um, putting a notation that things are being signed electronically or? Hi, Aaron, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I don't know, honestly. Um, since the last Concom meeting, I really, um, I haven't, uh, haven't thought much about that. But we could easily reach out to uh, Chris Brestrup and others. I, I do know that there's a fair bit of, uh, like, like uh, currying down. You know, people meeting at the back door, signing things. You know, other other board and committee members. So there's still a lot of uh, just kind of the way we used to do it happening, but uh, from using social distancing. So okay. let's find out from other departments what they're doing. I just don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Sounds good. So stay tuned for that. Probably at the June 10th meeting, we'll have um, everything recorded and then a better idea of kind of what our procedure will be on permits that we issue. For for um, notices of intent or orders of conditions, I'm not as concerned or even electronic permits like um, ANRADS because those are already already have an electronic signature process through EDEP um, where they can be filed electronically and issued electronically. It's more like determinations of applicability that I would be concerned with exactly what we're going to do to manage those. <clears throat> um, we got a request for emergency certification from Eversource for um, Pine Grove. Um, there, what they were having an issue with a transformer um, and a conduit coming out of the transformer shorting out, and they were going to do the replacement as a maintenance project, but um, 
I had encouraged them to file it as an emergency certification just so that we could have a little more control with regard to like <clears throat> having a plan in hand of exactly what they were doing, um, that we could put conditions for erosion controls and um, uh, just have something on paper showing where the wetlands are located. So they did file that with us and um, Karen, I'm sorry, where's Pine Grove? It is um, the little condominium complex that is um, If you're I believe it's off Old Farms Road. If you're going into Amherst Woods, you go past that gull pond and it's on the left back there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, Bear with me just one moment. Sorry, I had all these queued up and of course the minute I get on here, um, they're not queued. Um, Pine Grove. So they issued us this letter. Uh, it allows me to see it. And um, I haven't actually gone out to do a site visit yet, but there are photos. Um, here, so here's the plan. They have actually since updated this plan with to include erosion controls. Um, there's also the um, transformer is now shown with erosion controls around it. And then I also asked them to show the existing conduit that's being abandoned, which is um, right along the edge of this, the wetland that's shown sort of in the center of the map. So they did provide that. I can show you an update. And then these are pictures of the location where the work is taking place. And so I did issue that today. They're planning on starting work tomorrow to do the um, installation of the new line. And switching between two screens. So bear with me here just a minute. Um, and then the update was in presentations, I believe. Um, oh, you know what? It's actually on my PowerPoint presentation. There it is. So you can now see where they added in some details um, to show um, this is the line that's being abandoned here, the erosion controls that are being installed, and then the transformer, and then the erosion controls around the transformer. So um, I went ahead and issued this for them to do the work right away because it's shorting out and these folks are losing power. Um, and yeah, I just would ask that the board consider ratifying that emergency certification. So do you want us to do that now? Sure. I mean, as long as, yeah, as long as we're there, we might as well. Yep. Okay. So looking for a motion to certify this. Make a motion to certify the emergency certification for uh, Pine Pine Grove. Second. So all in favor, aye. Aye. Aaron, do we still need to go through each individual and say, Yes, we okay. do, unfortunately. Okay. Fletcher? Aye. Jen? Aye. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Brett? Aye. So, unanimously passed. Okay. Do you want to maybe jump to, um, to Dave and his report now? Because that's the next items on my report are the Keith Haskins and the Ag License if Dave's ready and wants to jump into that. That sounds good. And then, yeah, 7.30 is our first um, schedule time. So does that work for you, Dave? Aaron, are you done with all of your update? I have a few um, very minor things, but um, there's not a lot in terms of other business to share. We have four hearings, so it's kind of just hearing heavy meeting tonight. Okay. 
I can try to be quick. I did want to just before we jump into Keith Haskins and um, ag licenses, I just wanted to give a couple of quick bulleted updates as Aaron did, just to give you a sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, what's going on out there. Um, so um, just to give you all a few things uh, to think about and, and happy to answer questions tonight or by email or phone. So um, we are grappling at the town level a little bit with the status of buffers bond. Uh, as you know, with COVID-19, uh, the governor did uh, issue some new guidance on beaches, both coastal, coastal beaches as well as uh, lakes and ponds. So our goal is to try to open puffers in some fashion. I think um, I'm targeting not this coming weekend, but probably the following weekend. Um, and we would try to do it in, in the safest way possible. I'm noticing in the background that I'm in my son's uh, room and, and there was something on the wall there. It looks like an art exhibit, but it's just, it was covering something. We took something down and, and uh, never painted behind it. But anyway, um, so we're trying to open Puffer's Bond in some, some, some form. Uh, in all likelihood, it'll be something like they're doing in New York City, even in Central Park with the circles. And then the circles are where you should park your family or your, your towel. And then those circles will be 12 feet apart. So we'll probably be doing something like with water soluble paints, uh, something of that sort, and, and go for a month like that. Um, I think we're going to get help from uh, the police department in terms of helping with parking enforcement. Clearly, this will uh, not allow the density um, that we're, we're used to at Buffer Spawn in the summer. It might really be on the main beach, it might be 25 to 30 circles. And on the beach across the pond, it might be another 20, 25. So it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to accommodate, you know, 300 people. Um, so you'll see more of that coming out, I think, in the newspaper in a week or so. Um, but um, corresponding to that is the fact that COVID-19 has so struck our budgets that I'm not really sure I'm going to be able to hire summer staff. So right now it's just Brad and Tyler. And I've made it clear to the town manager that, you know, we can't operate Puffer's Pond and take care of Puffer's Pond without summer staff. So we're talking about whether we could bring on um, a smaller summer crew to work on trails and buffers and and um, you know kind of routine routine projects. I think that's the theme. I just had a meeting with Brad and and Tyler today, and I think that'll be the theme for summer of 2020: is no big projects, just maintain, keep trails open. Um, we've had a lot of storm damage lately. These flashy storms coming through have taken down a lot of trees. Um, and in, you know, kind of a little microburst. Um, so Brad and Tyler have been very busy uh, clearing trails and making sure that, um, for instance, I was on the Kevin Flood Trail a week ago, and I usually don't get very worked up about widow makers. I, I, I kind of think of them as, yeah, they're part of hiking in the woods. But there were a couple on the Kevin Flood Trail that actually had me very worried. So uh, they got out there and took those down quite, quite promptly. So I think it'll be a summer of mostly maintenance on the trail because we're not going to have four or five extra bodies working out there in the field with Brad and Tyler. So um, that'll be a theme. Um, lots of beaver activity. Beavers are doing very well during COVID-19. Um, uh, I was out hiking at Podick in Catherine Cole Sanctuary last weekend and boy, um, we lost a major trail. The trail in Podick yeah, so, need waiters to get through there now. I think we're gonna we're gonna need to. We might have to need. We might have to have a site visit out there. It might not be bad to schedule that. Aaron is just to talk it through with you all, because if yeah. we maintain that trail, um, at the very least, we're gonna have to breach some dams. It's oh yeah. You know, I have I have a potential idea on that. Um, just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to throw this out there while we're on the subject. Reintroduction of wolves or mountain lions? Well, I was talking with um, Melissa Green from BSC, who she's the one who brought the um, NOI application for before us for the Podic substation. Mm -hmm. And they actually, um, Eversource 
you may recall, um, had to put in a new pole behind the substation. And um, as part of that, they actually have to install a permanent access road um, because the temporary access isn't going to be suitable for them to be able to access the pole for maintenance. And so she's looking for something she can do by way of mitigation um, for that project to support the town and she mentioned specifically the beavers across the street because I had reached wow. out to Eversource about taking the dams down and they said they weren't they didn't really they weren't interested in doing it so much but as part of a mitigation for their project that might be something we could ask Eversource to do so just putting that out there yeah well maybe let's can we add that to a site visit in two weeks or something um yep it doesn't take, it'd be a quick site visit because really it's a five minute walk to the dams or a five minute walk to the trail that is um, blocked. So either way. Would you want Eversource rep to attend with us or just us? No, I think it's just us. I okay. mean, we have a proposal for Eversource, but we'd have to decide what is the proposal? Is it just to pay for trapping? I mean, that's, yep. you know, that's pretty straightforward. But again, it would you know, trapping on conservation land is a little bit higher bar historically for the department and for the commission. So I think we'd have to talk that through. Okay, um, sounds good. So um, still waiting on other COVID-19 impacts. Clearly the budget for the town, I think the town manager has kind of messaged that 2020, which takes us through the end of June, we should be okay. But 2000, excuse me, FY21 is going to be a very difficult year for the town because of all the drops in revenue across the board. Um, other quick updates. Um, Brett had asked me to look out at Wentworth Farm, so I spent quite a bit of time out there. I've uh, been out there twice. Um, we actually have at least two pretty significant encroachments. One, which is, um, there may be three, but the, the two that are most glaring um, are, are uh, off of Kestrel Lane, broadly off of Kestrel Lane. Um, one is when you turn the corner of Kestrel Lane, uh, there's some folks who've been doing some clearing toward the wetland um, on their property and perhaps a little bit on our property. And then uh, Brett had called my attention to these folks who really expanded their backyard um, and really there's no fence line anymore between our property and their property, and there's no vegetation. They've basically mowed right out to the edge of our property. So um, I'm in the in the process of writing. I, I met with the folks on the corner of Kestrel Lane. I have not yet met with the people of uh, the other encroachment, but I'll meet with them. And then basically I'll be writing both of them a letter saying what what it is they need to do to restore our uh, property lines, if you will. At the very least, they just need to stop mowing, stop clearing, um, all of that. And, and nature just need nature will fill those in pretty quickly. Um, so I will keep you posted on, on both of those situations. There may be a third one to the west that I'm looking into as well. Um, let's see. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, Let's see what else is on the list. In terms of projects, I mentioned tree clearing, trails, trailheads. Um, Brad and Tyler were doing some uh, routine maintenance on the dam at uh, Epstein. Uh, recall that we are required to keep dams cleared of vegetation uh, by DCR Dam Safety. So um, they do this in the watershed. Uh, I must admit we are not as good we are not as good at that maintenance as DPW is, and we need to get better. So um, that's something that, uh, you know, is typically something that the summer staff would do, and they would just come in and make sure that you don't get woody vegetation growing on the, the upstream or the downstream face of a dam or a dike. Um, let's see. They also did a little clearing of invasives at the Ritchie Conservation Area. Uh, next time you go by Ritchie, which is on Bay Road, on the south side of Bay Road, there was a tremendous tangle of uh, autumn olive and um, um, some Japanese knotweed and um, multiflora rose. And so a lot of that was really um, uh, mowed down. 
Uh, let's see, finally, Hickory Ridge. Um, uh, we are proceeding with Hickory Ridge despite COVID-19. We are proceeding as if we will purchase that property. Um, there's still some hurdles that we have to move through with the owners, but um, all indications are, are that um, that will proceed sometime this summer. So um, that's going to be a big nut for all of us if we, you know, if it all goes well, and we've promised the community a, a kind of a master planning process that I think the commission would have to be kind of deeply involved with because a lot of it pivots off the core of that property, which would be permanently protected. Mm -hmm. So um, there would be some land that might be developed on the frontage as we discussed, but the, the remainder of the property for the most part would be, um, would be preserved. Just to recall the numbers, it's 150 acres total. There would be 26 acres of solar, uh, about six or eight acres of developable frontage, and then the rest of it is all estimated in priority habitat for rare species. And I have gotten quite a few reports actually out there of people seeing um, lots of wood turtles. It's really a pretty, pretty incredible place for the, the wood turtle populations along the Fort River moving up and down the fort. So. Dave, so Dave, who's, who's responsible for that initiating the planning? Us? Well, a lot of it's going to pivot off of me, but I think the commission has to be a key player. We would, I think it would be the commission. I think it'd be the commission. I think the Affordable Housing Trust would want to be at the table. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd enlist the help of the planning department. Um, yeah, I think I think those would be the major players. And then lots of community members want right. to right. express their interests or their hopes or their dreams for what Hickory would look like. Mm -hmm. um, if you go by there, you will notice that the course has grown up a little bit, um, but yes. they are, they are uh, it's probably not playable anymore, but they are hiring staff. They're going to have somebody maintain it for the next couple of months. Not as golfable, people but at least playing, so it doesn't grow up. People are yeah. playing it, but there's yeah. an awful lot of dandelions. <laughs> A lot of dandelions, good, good bee <laughs> habitat, good pollinator habitat. So, yeah, there's probably more dandelions that have been been there and uh, more today than there have been in the last 50 years. So, a lot of <laughs> So, those are my quick updates around town. Um, lots going on. And commissioners have any questions for Dave at this point? So, um, actually, I do have a quick question. Sorry, Dave, you actually reminded me of the Widowmaker. Um, I was just riding my bike by, who do I call? I guess it'd be DPW on Pine Street by the bus stop. A big oak has split. You couldn't see it unless you're really looking. And it's a big limb and it's probably, it's definitely going to fall on the road, sidewalk road and possibly the power line. Um, who, do you, who do you call for that? Sure, whereabouts is it, Fletcher? If you go down Northeast Street and take a left on Pine Street, so going uh, west, past uh, State Street on your right, there's that bus, there's a little new pull in for the bus stop. Mm -hmm. It's right there, right past okay. the bus stop. You look up, you'll see a huge oak and it just, it's recently just split. Okay. And that well, big limb is coming, it's coming down. Yeah, I'll be, um, I actually have another meeting to go on to in a few minutes, but while I'm okay. with you all, I'll send a quick email to DPW. But just in the future, um, uh, DPW on their website has a feature called See, Click, Fix. And any resident, you can, it's a free down app on your phone. And if you see anything out like a catch basin open or a clogged catch basin or a tree that's uh, damaged or um, whatever, um, uh, you know, a dangerous pothole. You can actually just send them a, a message on C Click Fix from their website, and it goes into a system. It gets assigned to somebody, and then you get an email back or a text back saying it's been resolved or cool. when it'll be resolved. We're actually thinking about getting on board with that with conservation, so you could do the same thing as report on a trail condition, a beaver problem, or beaver flooding, or a tree down, or something like that. So, see, click fix. 
Yeah, could be a lot of work. I don't want to pick all of those, but yeah, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that one. <laughs> of C click fix. Yeah. Well, keep you down anyway, no, a it's a good idea. I hear you. Um, being me. They're ready to get yeah, a lot of potholes. A lot of pothole requests. So. I had two questions for you regarding puffers. Um, so mm -hmm. one, once all of those spaces are allotted, nobody's going to be allowed in. So that's the first question, I assume. And then are there going to be time allotments? Can people go there and camp out there all day? Or are people going to be requested to, when it's full, to only be an hour? I'm not sure what the right time is. but That's a great question, Brett. And boy, I don't know the answer. I, I've been looking around a little bit online, and there's all sorts of different you know, from coastal beaches to ponds and lakes, there are some who don't have any limits. You, you know, you go to whatever, yeah. you know, a beach on the Cape and you can park there all day as long as you stay 12 feet away from your next closest neighbors. Then there's other places that are putting limits, but it's, I mean, we don't have the staff to go, okay, you know, you're, you're done. You, you said you were, you arrived at three. It's almost like chalking a tire in a, in a town and say, you, you know, you've parked there too long. So I don't see how we can do that. Um, the challenge is we're probably going to have a, a parking attendant. You may have noticed we dropped off Jersey barriers on State Street. We're probably going to have a, somebody from the police department, uh, parking enforcement, standing there saying, okay, there's 25 spaces available, let's say, hypothetically. Um, and there's three open right now. So the next three cars can come in, but the three after that, you're out of luck. You, you, can't, you can't come because there's no room on the beach for you. So it's gonna be a logistical challenge to manage this for, I hope it's not gonna be the whole summer. I hope, I hope we're gonna, maybe some of this stuff will ease up in a month. So it might just be for the month of June, say through July 4th, so. It's not going to be perfect, and I think we're going to have a lot of unhappy people. Um, did you have another question, Brett? No, uh, that it was kind of a two-part, but you you answered both of them, so I'm good. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, but um, it's it's a challenge. Um, do we want to move into? I'm sensitive to time here for you all. Um, so wanted to talk a little bit about Keith Haskins. Um, so on both Keith Haskins and the Ag licenses, I wanted to just talk through these tonight and then give you some time to think about it. I'm not looking for any signatures or votes tonight. Um, Keith Haskins is the property and Aaron, I don't know if you can tee up the map. Was there a map with Keith Haskins? I think there was. Let's see if that. So Keith Hoskins is the property we yeah, recently was. purchased from the oh, Coles family. Like yeah, my, my internet is freezing here a little bit. Aaron, do you want to grab that? If not, I think I have access to that as well. Yes, I'm pulling it up right now. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, so very quickly, um, can everybody see that? So very quickly, um, this is the property we, we purchased from Kohl's. Uh, we got a land grant, a $400,000 land grant to help pay for the property. And we're, we're in the process of uh, uh, putting the required conservation restriction on the property. This is something that is required by the state, by state law, if you, if you use CPA funds and the, and so we need a third party to hold the CR. That third party is the Castro Trust. Um, the document is a pretty standard document. Um, the exception to this, if you looked at it at all, is that the raw water line from Atkins Reservoir goes under or through, if you will, this property, the length of this property. So 
what we had to do was reserve the right for DPW to maintain that water line in perpetuity. So the most unique thing about this conservation restriction is uh, providing access and the ability of the town, if you will, through DPW to maintain the raw water line, which takes water from Atkins Reservoir to the treatment plant in Cushman and then into our system to serve the residents of Amherst. Other than that, the conservation restriction, you know, it, it allows, it allows um, uh, with permission, it allows management of the property, trails, it, it allows uh, timber management, if that's something the town wanted to do in the future. Um, it prohibits all the things you would think from tennis courts to um, um, large structures, um, cell phone towers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't think there's, there's too many other moving parts to it. Um, that's the main feature is that um, water line going under the property. It's about a 10 inch water line. Um, so that's um, the Keith Haskins conservation restriction. Um, what I'd like to do is see if the commission would take a vote on it in two weeks. Does that seem reasonable? Hmm. You're all kind of freezing on me. I don't know if it's my, my internet. Hmm. I could certainly put it on the agenda. I do, I'm freezing up a little too. Yeah. Um, so anyway, let's, if we could put that on the agenda for two weeks from now, and if anyone, as you're reading through that document, um, it's pretty standard, as I said, boilerplate, the state, we use a state boilerplate, we make some adjustments, as I said, for things like the water line, um, and then the rest of it is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, we want to protect the property in per perpetuity, and, and the state wants to make sure the town doesn't do anything, so they have a third party watch us in perpetuity, and in this case, it's the Kestrel Trust. So that's that. So moving along to, um, I included two documents, um, I think that Aaron just forwarded to you today. I apologize they got to you so late, but um, I don't know, Aaron, can you punch up the ag use policy? So let me tell you where we are. We've, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, while she's doing that, Stephanie Ciccarello and I have had multiple conversations and site visits with um, Ryan Carb. Um, he is all set to go on his two parcels that he is licensing uh, from the town. One is Haskins Meadow out on East Leverett Road and the other one is Amethyst Brook. Um, he's been on, he's been using um, um, Haskins Meadow for a number of years. Um, but what I wanted to do is just give the commission, um, he's, he's fine, he's in a good place, I think, on, on all of this, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Amethyst Brook in a minute. Um, but I just wanted the commission to see that the agricultural licenses are based on and, and linked back to this document you see before you, this Amherst Conservation, Conservation Land Use Policy and the recommend, recommendations for ag use. So. Anybody who licenses land from the town through, through you has to accept this policy, and this is kind of our guiding document. I think once we get through this with uh, Ryan, which is pretty simple, um, straightforward, I think sometime during 2020, we should reopen this and have a fuller conversation to see where we are with, with this policy, see if there are updates we might wanna make. Um, there are some interesting things in there that the Conservation Commission, this was adopted, I think, back in 2011. It's been a while, nine years, nine, 10 years. Um, but you may have some different input and different feelings about things like fencing, uh, pesticides, herbicides, um, irrigation, things of that sort. So um, I just wanted to put that in your packet so you could see that's what we base the licensing on and, and anyone who licenses has to really accept that they're gonna follow this, this policy. The license that's in your packet is a pretty standard license. It was drawn up by Copeland and Page, our attorney, and it 
It covers everything from liability to insurance. It's pretty, um, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty legalistic. But Ryan, uh, really, we didn't make any significant changes. Uh, I provided you with the boilerplate. So again, at your next meeting, uh, we'll have individual licenses for both one for um, one for Haskins Meadow and one for Amethyst Brook. Um, just specifically on Amethyst Brook, um, Ryan is is all set to go there. Um, Stephanie Ciccarello from my office is working closely with him. Uh, we're going to have 10 plots at Amethyst Brook. Um, they're going to be marketed first to the people who are already um, gardening at Amethyst Brook. You may recall that there's actually seven other gardeners at Amethyst Brook. So a couple of them are going to move over to these new plots and Ryan is going to do some education and outreach to them, and he's going to mentor them as the season goes on. So we'll have 10 new plots at Amethyst Brook. Um, and then we'll discontinue the other plots that are kind of in the way and have caused quite a bit of friction between dog owners and, and gardeners uh, at Amethyst Brook. So I think in terms of length of license, I think you voted, I think you wanted to give Ryan a one year trial at Amethyst Brook to start off, and then we could renew and extend that next year. And I'm recommending five years at um, Haskins Meadow. So I think, why don't you take a look at the boilerplate? Um, we'll, we'll fill in all the blanks with Ryan, the location, any of the specifics between now and next meeting. And then, you know, we would take it to a vote at your next meeting. Practically speaking, he's on both pieces of property, um, now and, and you know beginning farming operations. So that's kind of where we are with those two. Um, Dave, would it be helpful to have that? Ryan? Um, yeah, Dave, would it be helpful to have Ryan attend our next meeting? Hmm. Yeah, that'd be fine. We can invite him to participate in the in the Zoom. And then you all can ask questions if you, yeah. But I think he's, the la we had a conversation with him a week, week and a half ago, and he seems to be in a very good place, yeah. So why don't we invite him, Aaron? You can remind me and yeah, we'll I mean, invite him. Like and that'll be the night to kind of solidify everything. I'm losing, I'm not hearing sure. what people are saying. Do that. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, it seems like things are going very well with you. Yeah, we're, we're always a little slow on this end, but Ryan, practically speaking, is out there. Um, Stephanie Ciccarello and um, Angela Mills in the town manager's office have been uh, in contact with all the gardeners at um, Amethyst Brook. And they're going to work with Ryan on um, getting the plots um, um, rented, if you will, uh, the ten, the ten new spaces. There'll be twenty. I think they're twenty by twenty, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty big, actually. Mm -hmm. Are we still on this? I'm losing you all. Okay. That sounds great, Dave. I turned off my video because you guys kept freezing. So I'm just going to do that. Quick yeah, like I know some some bandwidth here. Yeah, maybe I'll turn mine off as well. Maybe that'll yes, help. Yes, here, but it sounds good. So I think, Aaron, you can move back into your regular agenda. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dave. So are there any other questions for Dave before we move on? And I'll be, I'll be here for a while. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, so at this point, why don't we move on to our 730 agenda item. And so I saw that um, Bucky is here. So Bucky, I will promote you to panelist. 
Um, if there's anybody else from the public who's here who is for our 7.30 Winston Court um, hearing, if you can just raise your hand in Zoom and then we can promote you to panelist. Okay. Okay. Um, so let me just formally open this. Um, this meeting is being held as required by provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protections of wetlands, as most recently amended the Town of Amherst Protection Bylaw. Um, so Aaron, first off, this has been in front of us before, but how is this, or maybe Bucky, um, well, let me start with Aaron first, Bucky. Um, so Aaron, how is this different than what we've seen before? And then I'll ask Bucky to give a short presentation. Sure. So you guys might recall a couple months ago, um, Bucky had come before us to basically get some guidance on um, whether it would be acceptable for him to file um, an RDA or if he should be filing an NOI um, because he's basically repaving an existing footprint and not um, making any, you know, substant, there's no, it, there's no change to impervious surface. So it's kind of a gray area as far as the Wetland Protection Act is concerned. Yeah. So he had proposed filing it as an RDA and he had come before the board um, to get our guidance on that. And the board was in favor of him filing it as an RDA. So that's what he has filed and submitted to us. And that's what he's presenting to us today. Um, from what I understand, the scope of the project has actually been reduced um, quite a bit, particularly within the jurisdictional riverfront areas, because they decided not to pave the area, repave the area closest to the river. They're just sticking to the area that's um, more on the the upland side of the um, of the condominium complex. So that's the back story, and uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Aaron. So, yeah, because I remember that this came before us and I was just trying to kind of get everything straight. And so, Bucky, I hope that Aaron didn't um, steal too much of your thunder, but if you will introduce yourself and give a brief um, overview of the project, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, my name is Bucky Sparkle. It says so on the screen tonight. It's kind of nice. I have a name tag, I guess. And um, yeah, I was up in January to get a little guidance on this project. Aaron did a wonderful job in summarizing that previous meeting and the discussion thereof for Winston Court. And um, in, since January, we finished the design. The owner made some tweaks and that they're reducing the amount of area that they're looking to rework. Everything's being done, mm -hmm. basically replacing it in place. Uh, at the time of the RDA meeting, there were requests made for me to look at opportunities to either reduce the amount of stormwater runoff from the site and or improve the quality of the runoff. Uh, the site was built in the late 60s, early 70s, so it has exactly zero BMPs in place. Um, and the, the owner, Hampshire Property Management Group, is um, they're really great to work with, my favorite clients, because they just want me to do the right thing every time, and they often go above and beyond what's required. And here again, they said, yes, Bucky, do whatever you can. Um, and I took a look at it. I, unfortunately, the soil situation is it's thick, wet clay for the most part on this site. So we don't have a lot of opportunities to get water underground. Um, and what I'm going to do is share my screen and bring up the plan so that you don't have to look at my office anymore. And we can, uh, I can start pointing at the things that are really important here. Clicky click. So hopefully now you're able to see the plan for the site. I'm going to zoom in just a, a little bit here um, and focus on uh, just the resource areas and what we're talking about. Hopefully you can follow along with the cursor. Um, so on the very left side of the screen, uh, there's a little bit of the Fort River that was uh, flagged and located. Uh, Ward Smith did this location. It was picked up by our surveyors. And the 200 foot river front is this dotted blue line. The wide green line are wetland flags. As you can see, they're relatively close to the site. And the narrow green line is the 100 foot wetland buffer. Um, and the sidewalks and the pavement in front of the buildings and to the side of the buildings are being reworked. Uh, they were going to consider repaving rather than just resurfacing. Uh, the back portion of the site, but it's really not critical. So they're going to save some money and not worry about that. Uh, 
Uh, and really the area of the site that's subject, uh, well, what we're doing is uh, the area is in gray, we're repaving. So that is on the east side and on the south and west side is this area that we're repaving. And I didn't bother to highlight the, the spaghetti nest of sidewalks that are existing that are being removed and replaced. Uh, this area in the sort of pink bubble is the area subject to the Wetlands Protection Act, uh, although we are considering the whole site, you know, one project, of course. And uh, in terms of uh, what I've been able to do for BMPs, there are two existing catch basins that collect um, runoff from the pavement. They're the only catch basins in the road for this project. So one down here, one here. So we are, um, my screen says my internet connection is unstable. Are you still hearing me? Can somebody confirm? Is this thing still on? I can Hello? still hear you. Oh, I got, all right, thumbs up, great. Yeah, my, I got a funny, I got a it's funny message that said I'm unstable. Oh, okay, okay, great. Um, just start waving if I really do fade out. Uh, so. <laughs> anyway, so the two catch basins, we are retroactively installing a product that involves a small catch as well as filters that uh, filter the, the runoff from the pavement in the parking area. And the, these filters themselves, they're fairly inexpensive. They're just 40 bucks a pop. They get replaced every year. And they're going to stop 80% of total suspended solids from going downstream, which is a really nice benefit to the environment. So we're, we're making a market improvement to the water quality. Uh, by installing these filters. Additionally, uh, the best I could do for the volume is uh, install a dry well in this location. There aren't a lot of places where we could do it where we're not going to cut into clay and or the existing groundwater. So I have to keep it as high on the site as possible. And the front half of all of the buildings uh, go to downspouts. The downspouts currently all drain into the pavement and then uh, into these catch basins and then directly to the wetland. So what we're doing is we're collecting all of the roof water by these orange lines. This is the collection system and bringing it to a dry well. So smaller rain events. So we're talking like, you know, less than an inch of rain, but those are the most common events. Those are going to feed the dry well. And actually we're not even going to be discharging roof water, at least to the wetland in those cases. Uh, of course, whatever runs off the pavement is still going to go that way, but it will be filtered. And for larger events, a drywall will get filled up. It'll overflow and then continue off to an existing drainage system, which of course connects downstream. Uh, so we are able to improve both the water quality for the runoff with the filters in the basins and reduce the volume of runoff by taking the roof area and installing it into a dry well before, uh, you know, in large rain events, it goes downstream. So those are the improvements that I've been able to fit on the site. Um, definitely, you know, and especially with the filters, it's a, a nice addition to what's heading downstream. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to rip stuff up that was put in the 60s and put it back. Um, I do show on this uh, uh, plan, these, the dash red line here, we are installing sediment logs on, uh, on the down gradient side of all of the work. Uh, and creating a little flat area because uh, any runoff that misses a catch basin that's below it ends up in this spot. So I'm making sure to catch that uh, in a level area. Um, this type of project, uh, the disturbance of the pavement, removing and replacing it, uh, it's really just a few days worth of work within a week. So the contractor shouldn't have heavy weather events to manage because uh, they can predict the weather with a few days out. Uh, the sidewalk work, that's going to take a little more time. Uh, only a little bit of it is, is within the jurisdiction, but all of that is protected from uh, erosion by uh, either, well, both running over a grass area for a little while uh, and then eventually the sediment logs downstream. So that's the summary of the project as well as the BMPs in place. And I'm opening it up to the commission to talk about it. Thank you, Bucky. There's, yeah, that's some really nice improvements and great to see all of that. So Aaron, was there a site visit here today? Yes, there was. Um, I am going to steal the screen share if that's okay at this point. Yep. Um, let me know when you guys can see it. Oh. 
Uh, we can see the Haskell property at this point there. Hmm. There we go. Okay, just took a second. Can you see the photos now? Yes. Okay. So um, the area that Bucky referenced um, that um, where the parking area is in a portion of it's in riverfront and buffer zone. The first photo on the left is standing in that area and then looking back up toward, is that Harkness Road? Gatehouse. Gatehouse Road, excuse me, yep. up towards Gatehouse Road. And then the photos on the left, or on the right rather, are the locations where the dry well, approximate location where the dry well would be situated in front of the, um, complex. And then this side is the other side of the um, pavement going down that's outside of jurisdiction, but just to kind of show you guys what it visually looks like. Okay. Thank and you. There wasn't any, there wasn't any, um, really substantial um, concerns from my perspective. They're not expanding um, uh, impervious surface, so there's no trigger for um, needing a stormwater management plan. Um, and uh, they have uh, what appeared to be adequate erosion controls in place. So I didn't really have any standout issues with it. Sounds good. So do any of the commissioners have any Comments or questions, and then we'll have a open quick, up. quick question, Bucky. What's the deal? The filters—they have to be. You said they're like forty bucks or something. So they they require a lot of maintenance, uh, or like annual, they annually. So, just annually. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty minor thing. I'm gonna recommend to the, the manager that uh, they do inspections quarterly for the first year. I think it's a small enough area that they. Probably they probably won't even have to change the filters every year, but I'm still going to recommend that as a minimum amount of time. If this were a, a shopping mall or grocery store, uh, I'd, I'd want them to swap them out more frequently. But uh, the reality is very few people park in this area. The residents all park in the back. It's just for the occasional guests. Um, but people do certainly drive through here. And I think the biggest pollutant right now is the asphalt itself. <laughs> as uh, it deteriorates, as you can see in Aaron's photo, that that's getting washed downstream right now. So repaving in and of itself is actually going to be a benefit to the environment in this case. But yes, those filters, I've, I've started to rely upon them pretty heavily. I love them dearly. I'm gonna hope I keep loving them in five years after I get feedback from my clients over the last few years that I've been recommending them. I think that they're a pretty, um, especially in space limited areas, they're, they're a great way to capture suspended solids. You can get even fancy ones, just so you know, that can do um, different limitations. So if you have TMLDs, uh, just not for this project you don't need, but if you need to reduce one chemical or another, they do make um, ones that are specific to different environmental pollutants. Mm -hmm. And Bucky, is that captured on the plan or in some other documentation or should that be in order of conditions? It, it is on the plan. Um, there, it's called out on the plan specifically um, on the structure schedule, and there are details. If you'd like, I could share the screen again. Uh, it may not be terribly informative, but um, nope. I'm, I'm happy to point that out. Nope, as long as it's documented somewhere, that, it, that works yep, for me. So thank you. Anybody else have any questions before I open it up to the public? Okay, so if there's people here from the public who haven't been on one of our Zoom meetings before, um, now is your chance to ask questions. There is a little toggle switch where you can raise your hand. And if you do so, uh, Aaron or I will hit the allow to talk button and uh, you can ask your comments. So this is a pretty straightforward one though, I think. Okay, so not hearing one. Um, not hearing anything else from the commission. I think we're looking for a motion at this point. And Erin had the language for that one on one of her slides. So I'll make a motion for a positive determination on Winston Court repaving. 
Back in bed. Okay, you hear that? Um, so I just want to make sure it's positive um, under the local bylaw, but negative under yeah. the Wetland Protection Act. Okay, I was confused because I was just reading verbatim there and I was like, ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, positive determination under the local bylaw and a negative determination under Chapter 131. Seconded. Thank you. Um, so why don't we go ahead and we'll start the roll call vote. So Jen? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Brett? Aye. So we are good at this point, Bucky. So Thank uh, you. anything else that we need to do at this point, Aaron? I think that that is, that's all set for, for that project. We can move on to the next one. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Bucky. Um, Thank I'm sure you I'll see you again Bucky. sometime. Thank you, Bucky. You're welcome. Have a good night. Cool. Okay. So um, I have 757, so we are good to move on to our 745. This is a notice of intent. Oops, I have the wrong document to open. Okay. Um, so this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of, Common, of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst bylaw. This is for a notice of intent for the Common School um, that's also being presented by Berkshire Design Group for 521 South Pleasant Street. And so Michael Liu, uh, you are now a panelist. Is there anybody else here, uh, Michael, or um, do you know if there's anybody else here who is for this? Or if there is somebody else here, just raise your hand and we can make you a panelist as well. Hmm. Okay, so not seeing any, um, Michael, the floor is yours. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Can, I think we all know you. Can anyways, you hear me? It's always nice. Can you, can you guys yep, hear me? We are good. Yes. Well, okay, yeah. great. Um, so I will get started. Um, I just have, I'm only going to put up two um, images to talk about the, um, the site and give you an introduction to the project and then open it up for questions. I have the site plans available if you need to, if you want to ask any detailed um, questions about the design or so forth. But um, if um, and I apologize, this is my first uh, virtual Zoom me municipal meeting. So bear with me, but I've got the, um, if you, I guess if I get control, I can put the images up for you. Uh, you should and, hit share. And also just Michael, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. Oh, um, sure. Hold on a sec. All right, I'm Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, I'm with the, um, I'm working for the Common School um, to do a paving project. As you might know, some of the, the driveway is paved from South Pleasant Street into the site. There's a gravel turnaround and the uh, proposal is to repave the driveway, which is kind of in rough shape, and then to pave the gravel turnaround. As a result of doing this, we're actually decreasing the impervious area on the site by taking away some of that gravel. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the central area is going to be turned into a rain garden. Um, to handle the, the runoff from the uh, paved turnaround. Okay, hold on a sec. All right, can you see that image? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is just an this is just an aerial view of the site. South Pleasant Street is um, over on the left hand side as you're viewing it. You come into the the site, the driveway is paved to about the beginning of the turnaround here. And then the rest of this is gravel. And it's kind of, as you might be aware, it's kind of uncontrolled. I think the users that come to the site know how to maneuver and, and where to park, et cetera. But the gravel, you know, it gets moved around and they do a pretty good job of maintaining it. Um, but there's like undefined parking spaces and this is actually going to clean, you know, clean that up for them. Um, in case you need some more, more orientation, these are the built, two main buildings to the common school over here on the left. 
Um, this is a small garden area where there is a discharge from an existing catch basin that is in the gravel right about where the, uh, the hand is here. There's a pipe that discharges out under this little gray rectangle is a deck, a wood deck, small wood deck with a um, shed roof. And the, dr um, the outflow from that catch basin actually discharges under this deck. Um, so it's hidden. They, they built this deck, I, I don't even know when, many, many years ago. Um, let's see if I can get the other. All right, so this uh, rendered site plan um, shows the proposal. Uh, the, the kind of blue area down here is south of the site are wetlands, which extend uh, at the base of the uh, hill right here and then extend under the existing boardwalk to Larch Hill. And then there's a wetland here south of the uh, former Hitchcock Center building. There's a, a wetland finger that extends up into the site. Um, and then as you enter um, from South Pleasant Street, there are two isolated wetlands, a small one to the north here that's basically a drainage swale um, that uh, discharges through a pipe here um, at the property line into an existing catch basin at the street. And then there's another um, isolated wetland to the south of the driveway here, um, well below, a couple feet below the driveway um, that probably goes over the property line into the lawn area of this um, residential property. The common school formerly owned this property and they sold it, but they maintained this rectangular strip of land and combined it with the main parcel um, because they still um, use this barn for storage and so they wanted to maintain that uh, barn structure. Um, so as you come in, basically we're proposing to pave the driveway in its exact location. It wouldn't change, um, the width wouldn't change. Um, along the south side of the driveway from about the property line to just before the, the shed, the, there's a uh, bituminous berm that controls the water. Currently, runoff basically flows from north to south, you know, in this direction, but the berm prevents the runoff from going over the edge of the pavement into the wetlands and it directs flow um, out to South Pleasant Street, where um, it basically goes into the gutter line of South Pleasant Street. And there's an existing catch basin down here about 60 or 70 feet to the south of the driveway. We're, we're not proposing to do anything there, but repave the driveway, maintain the berm. That's the way it's been for the past 12 or 13, 14 years or so. Um, the berm is still in pretty good condition, but the driveway, as I mentioned, has um, you know, taken a little beating. There's potholes, it's heaved a little bit, et cetera. So it needs a new paving job. Um, and then we're going to continue the paving around the turnaround here. It's still going to be maintained as a one-way loop, but we're actually be, um, able to get some more green space in the center um, by defining the edges of pavement and where cars can drive. We're still maintaining the existing parking um, configuration uh, with, with cars parked here along the east side and south side. There's uh, uh, four handicap spaces proposed on the west side here. That's uh, currently how they function. We're just um, defining you know, where the parking is. Uh, but as I mentioned, this green space in the center um, is getting larger. So we're turning that into a rain garden. The pavement from about this point on um, or and around the uh, turnaround is all pitched inward toward the rain garden. We're gonna take that um, existing catch basin, which is right about here, uh, and it's going to become, instead of being in the gravel, it's going to be within the green space, within the rain garden. And we're going to alt, uh, adjust the frame of that up a little bit higher, about four inches higher. And that's going to function as an overflow for the rain garden, which holds about an eight inch depth of water before it would overflow into the drain structure and then out the pipe. Um, so in this fashion, we're actually going to we're actually gonna decrease the amount of water that's flowing through the pipe because it's gonna have a chance to get treated and infiltrate in the rain garden before it's discharged through the pipe here under that, that deck. Um, we are proposing to get to pull up the boards of the deck and put some riprap stone at the outlet um, because right now water's flowing out in a kind of an uncontrolled manner. It kind of 
leaks out and kind of flows to the southeast and then you know off the property and ultimately you know would end up in this wetland to this so as i mentioned we are decreasing the impervious by about 550 plus square feet it's a nominal amount but it is a decrease and technically um because of the decrease in impervious uh, we're not even required to do stormwater treatment but um, the administration really likes the idea of a rain garden um, we do have plants proposed in there, a number of native trees and shrubs. We have a recommended um, pollinator and perennial plant list that they're very excited to, to have the kids and the parents of the kids uh, do those plantings. So they want it, they, they like having this, the idea of having this feature and using it for educational purposes. And it goes along with their, you know, the curriculum that they have at the common school dealing with, you know, nature and conservation, et cetera. So I think that's a, you know, that, that's a really great thing. We always want to, you know, put these features in and we hope that they're used for education. But in this particular instance, I think that, that you know, it, it will actually function that way. Um, there's another piece that we're also adding. I just wanted to mention that previously when we had looked at this site a couple of years ago, um, with a with a proposed new building, the fire department did want a um, to pave um, an emergency drive that as far back as we could. Um, we're and we're showing that pavement right there. Currently, as you might know, there's kind of like this gravel, you know, path that goes up the hill and then levels out at the top. So we're proposing to basically formalize that with a with a paved driveway. Um, and then we're also proposing to move the dumpsters here where, where a uh, dump or a, um, a trash truck could drive in and pick it up, you know, and then back out. Currently, the dumpsters are located right here as you come into the site. There is a piece of wood fence that screens it, but it's kind of like an unsightly place to have a dumpster. And it also helps them out, um, you know, because they'll be bringing uh, refuse or whatever to the dumpster. They don't have to like walk all the way over here to the corner or across you know, across the, um, the turnaround, they can just get on this walk and uh, get to the dumpster, basically on the same side of the driveway or roadway, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I, like I said, I, I don't have, I'm not going to show any of the detailed plans, the grading plans, but we can look at them if you have any questions. And I guess at this time, I'd like to open it up to the commission for comments and questions. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, so I have a couple of comments or questions, but um, first, Aaron, do you have any pictures <clears throat> or anything else you want to share? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, let me just steal the screen back. Oops. Can you guys see my screen? All I see is a Zoom screen from a web browser. Okay, I see. Um, okay, does that look a little better? It does, now we see your PowerPoint. Okay, great. Um, so some of my photos didn't make it and I apologize. Um, <laughs> These are, these are the photos out by the road. I, I tried sending it to myself multiple times because the camera, the conservation department camera lost batteries partway through. So I used my personal phone, but it wouldn't send them to me because they were too large. This is the driveway coming in. Um, and this is one of the catch basins at the end of the road, uh, at the end of the driveway rather on um, 116 Pleasant, uh, South Pleasant Street. Um, as far as uh, comments, uh, well, with myself and Leroy out on the site, so I don't know if Leroy has any comments, but um, basically my comment was that during construction that they would need to provide inlet protection for the catch basin that's in the center of the current gravel turnaround um, to make sure that it's covered and that material doesn't get into it to damage it or block it up during construction. And then um, protection at the outlet as well during construction 
to make sure that no material makes it through into the catch basin and then out of the catch basin and into the wetlands. But the locations of the erosion controls uh, made a lot of sense based on the topography. Um, so I don't think that there's going to be any problem with material getting beyond erosion controls during the paving process. Thank you, Erin. So any commissioners have any and, and, comments yep, or we are, questions? We're fine with adding We're, we're fine with adding um, protection, inlet protection. Um, that makes a lot of sense during construction. Uh, we, we are, we do show um, silt sock at the around three sides of that wood deck area. So that'll be maintained during construction to control any sediment that might get into the pipe, um, you know, and, and flow out of that, that um, outlet. Sounds good. Dave, you have your hand raised? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Brad. I, I had a couple of questions for Mike. Um, Mike, one question I had, I, I was glad to hear that the center uh, rain garden will, you know, provide some infiltration. So historically, the catch basin that is near the, the turnaround for the common school, that pipe goes kind of due south and it ends up discharging, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it ends up kind of discharging and then there's overland flow under the conservation boardwalk there for Larch Hill, is that right? Yes, once, once the discharge leaves that pipe, it kind of, it flows overland, then under the existing wood boardwalk and then continues, you know, obviously southward to the, to the larger wetland um, beyond to the south. Yeah, I guess this is more of a comment. I, um, I'm hoping that the design will provide more infiltration on the common schools property because I know historically that's been a challenge of that runoff coming from the dirt or crushed stone uh, right. RG turnaround. And, you know, there's been some volume coming under there. I know we've had problems with water kind of either eroding or overtopping or impacting the, the boardwalk there. So I just wanted to raise that as a little bit of a cautionary flag that we need to keep an eye on that during construction, okay. post-construction to make sure that mm -hmm. there really is infiltration and that, you know, for some reason we don't get more runoff going due south um, impacting that, that boardwalk. The other question I had for you is, there is a conservation restriction on the common schools property. Has that been discussed as part of this project at all? No, it has not. Um, not to mind. Well, I've, I haven't discussed that at all with the, uh, with the school or its consultant. And uh, by the way, Kevin, Kevin Campbell um, is an educational consultant who was supposed to be on tonight. I don't know if he, whatever, had trouble connecting or, or anything. Um, it wasn't intended that he'd make a presentation or anything, but um, he might be able to talk about that specific issue. Um, yeah, you may want to ask him because there is a conservation restriction on the common schools property. I, I believe it limits the amount of impervious surface that can be on that parcel. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the <clears throat> how the crushed stone turnaround or crushed gravel existing turnaround, whether that's considered impervious or not. Um, well, I guess oh, from previous Kevin Campbell is here. Oh, hi, Kevin. Or I see he's there. Um, in Amherst, the town considers um, gravel as impervious, just like pavement. And it, we, we mentioned, I mentioned this out when we, at the site visit. I mean, it does have a slightly lower um, runoff coefficient than asphalt, but you know, 0.9 versus 0.95 for asphalt. So, I mean, water does run off that, you know, almost at the same rate, if you will, as asphalt. So we've always, when working in Amherst, it's always considered 
impervious, and we include that in the in the calculations, you know, for um, uh, lot coverage, um, et cetera. That's what we're required to do in Amherst. So reducing the amount of impervious area, you know, is going to be a benefit to the to the run uh, to the site. You know, we'll get and we're going to get treatment in the rain garden, get a little infiltration. Um, out of the rain garden. So overall, there's going to be an improvement and, and reduction and should be a reduction in runoff from the site. Yeah, no, I, I just raised the, the issue just so your client is kind of aware that, you know, once the circle is paved and then you pave the, the uh, walkway in the back toward where you're going to put the dumpsters, which I think are all improvements, um, that kind of... Um, memorializes a percentage of the whole lot being impervious. So mm -hmm. if, there, okay. if, if there was an interest in the common school expanding in the future, yeah, right, you know, all of right. that square, square footage, which would decrease the amount that the common school could expand in the future. But anyway, I just put it out there that they may want to look at that restriction and just make sure they're you know, they're, they're on board with that and, and any impacts. And, but again, I'm, I'm not opposed to what's being proposed. I think it's an improvement. I think moving the dumpster out there is a great aesthetic improvement as well. Yeah. Dave, can you hear me? Kevin yes, Campbell? Yes, we can hear you, Kevin. Um, Dave, I only want to respond almost with a, a, a quip that uh, this project started in 1999. And um, so... <laughs> So I'm not envisioning, uh, well, at least not when you and I and all of us are sitting around them, them uh, looking for more expansion <laughs> in the next, uh, and, and this is what we got. But we will definitely uh, make sure, I appreciate the, the, um, the awareness check, that they know what they're buying. Thank you. So one question I had for you, Michael, was in regards to semi-pervious paving. Um, so I assume that that, uh -huh. I think I know the answer, um, but I assume that that's probably inappropriate for the primary parking area. Is there a role for that in that access, in the fire access, or not really? Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good point, Brett. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's inappropriate to use that kind of maybe pervious type pavement up there. Um, it does have to be, you know, maintained in the winter, obviously. So you're going to get some mm -hmm. plowing of that surface, but um, you know, overall, there's going to be. I mean, I mean, there's going to be no traffic there. You know, the only thing that's going to be up there is is the a, a trash truck, and God forbid if there's a a, a fire emergency and a, you know, truck or ambulance or something has to get up there. But the general public is not going to be driving on it. Um, I guess that's a question I'd have to pose to the school, though. They, one of the deals that one of the um, parents um, mm -hmm. at the right. school is donating the pavement. So they're getting a really kind of good deal on obviously, you know, finishing, you know, giving the surface a hard, the driving surface, something hard to drive on. So obviously the impervious you know even though it's a nominal amount it would still add some cost to the project um if it's something that you know you really want us to look into we can we can talk it over with the school and maybe you know um give it some consideration yeah i'm they, not i um, mean through the history i'm not you know, we've one way or the other but it seems like an opportunity Okay. Um. Okay, so are there other commissioners who have questions or comments? If not, I'll open up to the general public. Okay, so again, if there's somebody here from the general public who would like to ask a question or make a comment, if you just raise your hand and we will call on you. <clears throat> Okay, so not hearing any. Um, so anything else from the commissioners? Do we want more information? Um, do we want, I'm okay without the, the semi-pervious piece. Um, you know, if, as long as you want to bring that back to them, Michael, that's fine by me, but. Mm -hmm. All right. 
I mean, or yeah, I think that could be a, a, a minor a minor amendment that is considered later if they decide they want to incorporate incorporate that. That seems like it could be something easily modified. That works for me. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, um, so I'm not hearing anything. Um, again, this seems like it's pretty straightforward. It feels like there is a reduction, so that's great. Um, the rain garden is a great thing. Um, as what Dave was saying, yeah, we do have to make sure it actually functions, which I'm sure it will, but, you know, appropriate monitoring, uh, I'm sure will happen. Are there any specific conditions besides the other ones that you mentioned, Aaron, that we need to have? Um, let me just go back to my PowerPoint, sorry. Um, um these were the ones that i had um that i had listed just to well i think we should include our our standard boilerplate that we include for all of our um orders of conditions but then in addition to that recommend inlet protection for the catch basin and the gravel turnaround during construction um, outlet protection um, and then um, the erosion controls are fine i think as proposed Okay, so I see people nodding and I'll assume that people I don't see are nodding as well. <laughs> okay, so if that is the case, we are looking for a motion for this one. Um, and what would be the exact negative, positive, that sort of stuff? Um, it, it would be to issue an order of conditions under the local bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act with the boilerplate conditions and reference special conditions. I'll learn that one of these days, but until then, thank you, Aaron. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, roll call vote at this point then. So Fletcher? Aye. Brett? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Whoops, I'm sorry, Larry? Yeah, aye. Thank you, Jen? Aye. So, okay. So we are good, Aaron. Anything else you need from us on this one? No, nope, we're good. We can move on. Okay, so thank you, Michael, awesome. and thank you, Kevin. Thank Mike, you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You as well. Thank you, man. Okay, so they are going back down to attendees. Okay, um, so we have another notice of intent, um, and it's 824, so we're fine to begin. Uh, the this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protections of wetlands, and as most recently amended, and the Town of Amherst Protections Bylaw. This is a notice of intent for um, Zero Leverett Road. And so for those people who are here, if you can raise your hand. Okay, Joe, I see you. Oh, wait, yep. Okay, one sec. Okay, Joe, you are good. Uh, Nat. Should be good. Okay, and Stephen. Okay, um, so uh, we have a couple more people who were just promoted to panelists. And so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves and then giving a brief overview of the project, that would be most appreciated. Sure, I'll, um, I'll take it over. Um, my name is Joe Rogers. I'm an environmental consultant from GZA. Um, with me is Steve Riberty, uh, who's also an environmental consultant, and Nate Rye, who is an engineer. And um, basically, we're here tonight uh, to represent a project for um, Tessa Smith. She's interested in developing a single family home on a lot at Zero Leverett Road, which is about to get a number soon. It's pretty close to the border with Leverett. Um, and I'll show you, I can show you the location in a minute. Um, the reason why we're before you is because part of the work extends into the outer buffer zone. Um, there are two areas of work and I can um, highlight those on a, a plan for you if you'd like. That would be great. Okay. Um, share a screen. All right, are you able to see my screen? We do see a plan, Joe, yes. Great, okay, so here is um, the, the design plan for the, the home. There's a single family home, um, the driveway coming in off of Leverett Road. Uh, this is 
north to the right. Uh, the home and the barn and the road are all outside of the buffer zone. Uh, the work that we're here before you tonight is related to the installation of um, the leaching field for the septic system. Part of the siting work, we try to stay out of the buffer zone as much as possible, um, but because of the, there's a slight slope and the way that the, um, the perking came out, we needed to do some grading work. So uh, there's a dotted line right here um, where my hand is, and that is basically this little sliver of the outer, um, outer 50 to 100 um, that infringes upon the buffer zone. Um, so that the idea would be to install the, um, the leaching field, create a couple three foot um, graded slope that it would extend and be revegetated after it's, uh, after it's created. So in order to do that, there would be some, some scrub clearing. There's a fence line that's existing in this area um, that's shown here. Well, that's, excuse me, that's our, uh, our silt, silt uh, fence line. This is the fence line here. So out in this portion, there would be a little bit of, of clearing and then it would be, um, it would be seeded when it was done. Um, the second part of the project is up in the uh, upper part here. So I'll show you on a different plan. Um, this, this parcel was recently rejoined through an ANR. It was originally um, seven parcels that uh, came before the commission um, years ago. It was approved in, let me check my numbers here, 2006 for a seven, um, a seven lot subdivision. Um, so there was an order of conditions in 2006 and then it got uh, recombined again to a four lot subdivision just a couple years ago. Um, and now the current owners are basically combining, have combined five of the lots and they just are proposing to do this one home and barn. Um, they're interested in having horses on the property. And in order to have some pasture for the horses, they want to do some tree clearing out in this area here. Um, there's some, um, uh, areas that are also within the, the outer 50 foot buffer of this isolated vegetated wetland and um, the wetlands off, off to the uh, west of the site. So there, those are the two main areas of the project. All, all the work that's being proposed is in the outer, outer, outer 50 to 100. And um, in this area, it's conversion from forested to pasture. And in this area, it's just this, this sliver along the edge that would be um, seated after it's, the work is done. Uh, I just can't see it, Joe. Can you explain again the uh, leach field? It's in what part of the buffer? Sure, yeah. It, um, let me go back to that other figure that's a little bit closer. Yeah. So right here um, is the leaching field. This yep. um, dotted line, so yep. the, leech, the, the field itself is outside of the buffer zone. Okay. It's only this little bit of grading right here. Yeah. That is in, is in the like okay. 85 to 100 foot portion of the okay. uh, buffer zone. I see. So, so in order to support the elevation, the proper elevation for the function of the, the leaching field. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so just to be clear on that, Joe, so it is all outside of the 50. Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. Okay. Erin, do you have uh, pictures or anything else you want to show from today? I do. Uh, I'm going to steal the screen really quickly, Joe. Absolutely. Do I have to stop? I, I don't think you have to. Okay. I think I can just take it over. Um, Okay, can you guys see the photos? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, um, the front of the lot, um, 
is has a row of trees across it and then there's a, a large meadow um, so I'm sort of standing in the middle of the me meadow here on the left looking out towards the road and so you can see that line of trees and you can see where our cars are parked We're right alongside the road and then if I turn around and face the other direction you can see that it is also a large meadow with kind of some sprinkling of um, of some some uh, pines and oaks in there And then uh, this is looking over toward the one on the left is me looking over towards the right more. So um, where that tree line is when you're facing the back sort of in front of where Joe is walking and then on this one the tree line can be seen all the way to the left sort of in the distance. Um, that that fence line that Joe was talking about that existing fence line kind of follows that tree line um, just to give you a sense of that and then this this picture in the middle um, where this this larger tree is located, uh, they were planning on bringing the driveway in. Um, my understanding is just on the other side of that tree. That's so um, I think that the, just to sort of demonstrate that the, this is the area that's, that's outside of uh, 100 feet, the buffer zone begins sort of along that tree line. And um, that's where some of the clearing and grading would be taking place is just, just sort of starting to encroach on that tree line a little bit. But just for the commission's knowledge, there is forested, it's, it's forested in the area behind where the clearing is proposed so there's a large swath of, of forested area between where the clearing is taking place and where the wetland is located. And then the area that Joe had referenced which is um, the area that's proposed for the horse pasture in the in the back of the lot um, these this um, the photos on the right and left are the area that would be cleared for that horse pasture so that kind of gives you a little bit of a visual of what that area looks like currently that they want to convert. Oh, you, thank you. You happen to have a, um, a picture of the existing path. I, I'm assuming that would uh, lead to that pasture. Is that right? Uh, sure. On the um, on the site plan, plan, I can show you that. Or Aaron or uh, anyone. Yeah. I'll turn it back over to okay. you, Joe. All right. I think I have it. There. Um, so this is where the the future barn would be located, and in, in a paddock. And then there's yeah. a, there's an existing road that comes yeah. down through between the isolated wetland and the BBW. Yeah. And then, so what they were thinking about doing, um, you can either stay within the fence line. You can go to the right and use this area as the pasture. Right, because I mean, the, like realistically, it'd be like a gravel road because they probably want to drive a tractor down there and walk their horses back and forth. Is what I'm assuming. Um, I, there was no real conversation about any any road improvements as part right. of the project, yeah. Because, and then they need land clearing equipment to get back there and all that jazz, so. Can I, uh, um, and then I might have been the only one. Is this correct that I think I was around when this was, when this was delineated that is there, um, is this priority habitat back here? Hey, I'll, I'll chime in for a sec oh. on this one. Yep. So yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, maybe I I, you were the one that pre presented on it. Yeah, actually. I did. So, yeah. I, I, okay. I permitted this a couple of times. for a while. For the original subdivision, and then it was actually we permitted as a pasture in the in between the subdivisions too, so it was used as a pasture for a couple of years. But yeah, this was yeah. priority habitat, and then the map revisions in 2017, the priority habitat got pulled back on the other side of the rail lines. Oh, so it doesn't come onto this property anymore. There's a rail easement just off. Oh, because <laughs> what I remember, Brad, you you did a lot of work in putting together a, a, a like a turtle habitat plan. Oh yeah, project. we had we had this turtle mitigation plan and all kinds of good stuff out here. And so that all went out the door. Yeah, I went out the door. Nobody oh. ever built any of it. Hey, I, I thought it was a good job, but okay, <laughs> I did too. <laughs> it was kind of like in between the driveway and it, yeah, it was interesting. Oh, okay, so that now is not applicable. 
no, yeah, right, none, right. none of the natural heritage stuff applies. And and what Joe said, you know, going through the the the, the history of this, how it was seven lots, and essentially now with with our client buying two of the lots to put in this one house, it's turned from a seven lot subdivision to a three lot subdivision. And the other two lots, I don't know if they've been before you yet or not, but there's two other frontage lots off of um, Leverett Road that are getting developed next to this that are all all comprised that original seven lot subdivision. Yeah, this, I didn't know it's a new driveway or like new road cut getting put in the other day. Yeah, I think one of the other ones is a little farther along, but they may be all outside of buffer. Yeah. Market yes, they had that. submitted a um, correspondence to us um, that would be, um, gosh, it was it was I think Glenn and Chris, I think um, they're a little further down, but they're outside of the 200 foot and um, outside of the 100 foot buffer with all their work. They redesigned to keep it out. So. Cool. Wow. Okay, so other questions from the commission on this? Actually, Joe, could you put back up that aerial image? Because that, um, I think, is kind of a nice um, image to just show them kind of what the conditions look like there where the work is happening. Sure, yeah. Um, so on here, the, uh, this, you know, the Levert Road frontage is here. The uh, proximate location of the homes would be in this area. Um, the septic is in this area. And then the uh, path to get back to the area that would be, be cleared for pasture would be to expand this area. So basically to, uh, to, to, to in, enlarge this area of pasture. All right. Joe, did they look at alternatives or did you look at alternatives for particularly that pasture to be reconfigured so it's all the way outside the hundred? That's just not a viable option or yeah, the middle the middle of it, it's because it's it's um there's a the projection of buffer from the isolated, that small pocket um, wetland yeah. on one side, and then there's from uh, this wetland further in the back in the other way. And so it's it's kind of Two, two lobes on either side and, and a, a V in the middle that's, you know, out, out of the hundred. But it was mostly in order to, there's an existing fence out there um, that was put in long ago. And so they wanted to restore that area to maximize the fence line. Yeah, the fence was put in as part of the pasture subdivision we did probably circa 2011, 12 maybe. When they had, they had, you know, some horses and cows out here as part of the farm that was here for maybe five years. Okay. Yeah. I guess for me, um, I feel less concerned about the little bit of the grading around the leach field um, being kind of cleared as long as we have our standard conditions for sediment and erosion control. Aaron, do you have a professional opinion on the conversion from the existing kind of forest cover to pasture? I mean, having not, I'm sorry that I'm not, I've not been able to go out there and see that forest. Um, any professional opinions on that? Yeah, you know, uh, it's funny. I, my feeling was pretty much exactly the same as yours, Jen, as far as like having less concern about the grading for the house than for the the paddock i think um you know they are clearly they could be trying to push it quite a lot closer they're definitely making efforts to keep it out which i think is a good thing um one of the things i had mentioned to joe on the site walk was possibly you know sweetening the proposal with some um uh areas of planting for some pollinator habitat that might um, sort of add some habitat benefit to the area and um, just I mean because there's going to be impacts the other thing that I had um, suggested and I was thinking about this after um, was if just to make sure that we have a, a plan as far as manure storage for the horses, because this has been a plan, uh, an issue repeatedly with horses that at the end of the day, people kind of throw it back where 
you know, back in the woods where nobody's looking and those areas always tend to be near wetlands. So to make sure we, that there's a plan in place for composting and, um, or, or manure removal or however they're handling it, but just to make sure that those areas are outside of the hundred foot, I think would be my biggest, the biggest thing I would advocate for there. That makes a lot of sense. Also, Fletcher, any thoughts on like, so if they're clearing this, like probably what's pretty even aged kind of music forest structure to create a pasture, is there anything we can do on the borders or to improve like uneven aged habitat structures, things like that? Like, is there anything we can do to kind of create more of a habitat spectrum because we're oh. opening this clearing? Like, um, That's a good question. I, well, I mean, where they're going to clear, you can tell that it was pasture and it came in as pasture pine. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, it's, it's, the, I'm sorry. Um, it's a lot of white pine. And yeah. A, a yeah, pine I can tell. Yeah, it, looks, it looks pretty dry, music, uh, piney. Yeah, I've definitely followed a lot of deer through there. Um, <laughs> those damn fence in the way. The great thing would be to just take the fence down so the animals can cross <laughs> across from Eastman Brook over to the coal property over there, but that's not going to happen. So my only, my, in terms of forest structure, it's, it's grown in pasture. So that white pine, you know, you're not getting a lot of benefit anyway, but it, what my concern would be is basically you open the paddock up, then you open a road up to get to the paddock and how much more do you keep going? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really stop, right? Like it just, if you're putting a paddock back there, you got to get a farm equipment back there. So my, in terms of habitat stuff, you know, if they can just keep the front open and keep it grassy, that'd be great. You know, uh, Steve had this cool, like, wood turtle. Um, I mean, you don't really need wood turtle habitat stuff back th in there. But, like, if you can keep the front open and less lawn, you know, that type of stuff is good. But in terms of that pasture, that paddock there, it was already pasture at one point, And you're not going to lose a ton right there in terms of quality. Definitely maintain that, that wetland in the back. That place, that whole wetland's complex back there is actually pretty nice even, even though the railroad tracks go right in the middle of it but i mean yeah in terms of like you're not cutting down like huge mature trees back there to make that paddock back over. okay yeah but i, I think the limit of work needs to be de defined so it doesn't yeah. keep going yeah that's, that's my good. biggest fear fletcher is how we're gonna make sure that there's no creep sort of going forward it's, it's going to be constant creep. I mean, well, I, I know <laughs> it's going to happen. The, the existing fence line is, is a pretty good, you know, marker. That's, that's what their, the plan was designed to utilize and that, um, so that's, that's one way. It's pretty that's, where, that's where the pasture butts up against. Sorry. Yeah. It yeah, is. Okay. yeah. Should we think about any kind of heavier duty monumenting there guys like we always think about our big rocks or <laughs> i don't know anything to uh m to um mark that in perpetu in perpetuity as the edge of that clearing that's what crossed my mind jen and i like that idea i mean what's our yeah so joe and steve oh sorry go ahead Fletcher. well i was just wondering my jurist how what's our is our jurisdiction what we could do for like demarcating like the wetland boundaries we're not cool. talking like just the paddock, right? Yeah. Sorry, the, yep. the, the wetlands have actually been um, marked in a kind of a unique way with, um, they've been monumented. They're not, they're not flagged like uh, typical ones. They have um, inserted rods um, to mark the wetlands, which was a first <laughs> for me. It's the first time I had seen it too. They had done that for the last project. The, the surveyor had done that and there's most of the 90% of those those markers are still there after 10 years. Are they the ones with like the mushroom tops? No, it's a, it's like a, a one of those fiberglass rods like you'd put on the end of your oh. track and, and there's oh, like yeah. a little metal shiner on the top with the number, the wetland flag number, you know, etched into the metal. Hmm. Huh. So, I mean, that marks the wetland, but not the buffer, though. And Correct. so my Correct. opinion would be that, you know, the, this landowner, the next landowner, they kind of keep going back towards that. And so if we could put in some sort of permanent demarcation, uh, as Jen was saying, I mean, boulders are a favorite of our group. Um, you know, at the <laughs> But we're end, flexible. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of other ones, but this one is usually pretty feasible. So like boulders at the pivot points of, you know, where the fence line is out there to kind of like have more of a... I don't know what the spacing you would want on boulders. 
Yeah, it's we're flexible on it, like you know, every ten feet or something like that. I don't quite. So it's like a visual. Yeah, I think the pivot points is is a really good idea since it's a it's a zigzagging line. Um, I would also suggest maybe putting it at the limit of work for where the clearing is proposed specifically, um, because um, those are the areas, <clears throat> excuse me, that are going to be coming in question in the future. Yeah, exactly. Who's driving? Right, is that you, Joe? Is yeah, anybody I'm just, uh, oh, tracing the fence for you? Yeah. Is anybody concerned about the existing path to this paddock at all? That it goes. I hear you concerned about it, Fletcher, because um, you mean, think I'm it's not, just going to kind of get. Concerned, you think it's going to get heavy use? Well, I mean, it's existing, so I don't. I guess I don't really have too much. It's going to get cleared act, and. Yeah. Oh, that that helps. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Oh, that's the existing fence? That's the existing fence right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was confused where it was. Oh. So the so the path would come down here. Yeah. There is a gate on this side to get to the to the right of way. Yeah. But um, you know, the, the all the horses would be Oh, there's a right of way right there. That's why. Yeah, there's an Eversource power line right behind the Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I guess more than like I guess in terms of boundary marking that isolated wetland would be nice to have that mark. I don't know. Mm. I haven't been out there. I'm right at that exact spot, but it's probably pretty dry right now. Okay. Yeah. That fence line's a lot better to see now. <laughs> and the fence line continues across the back too, where Joe stopped it. It keeps going around right. the back side as well. But I do think monumentation on the corners of the proposed paddock, like those three, those three points um, where clearing the limits of clearing are going to be, and then possibly the pivot points around where the septic system is going to be um, would be particularly useful to indicate the limit of where the approved um, limits of clearing are. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because that's our main concern really, is creep. Yeah, so Joe, that makes sense from your side with the boulders? So to do, uh, to do the inflection point, to have markers on the inflection points to have permanent uh, demarcation. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is that something we can condition in, the, in an order? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I would say just at the areas where there is clearing encroaching on the 100 foot buffer, those would be the specific areas I would recommend calling out for boulders. <laughs> yeah, yeah certainly like, let's not go inside the buffer and place boulders randomly. That would not be good. Or outside the buffer for that matter. Right. That's outside our jurisdiction. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so before I open it up to the public, uh, any other commissioners have any other more comment? Any other comments? Okay. So I don't know if there's anybody new from the public, but um, if you have any comments that you or questions you'd like to raise, um, just raise your hand, and we will. Um, Elevate you so elevate you so you can talk. Okay, um, so I am not hearing any. Um, so we did get a couple of conditions for this one. So boulders at inflection points that are within the buffer zones. Um, the condition related to manure. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we want to put that in the conditions, Aaron. Did you have a specific idea? I would suggest that we require manure storage be uh, located outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Any other conditions? Then, well, I mean, I think the issue of pollinator habitat is one, you know, uh, whether you want to require that or not. That's another one that we had discussed. Always like it. But so where? We can definitely probably propose. Talk to, about like for the septic. That would be a maybe a good spot to um, propose some uh, pollinator conservation mix or something, instead of seeding the uh, graded slope in that area. Um, it could be maintained as as a, more of a pollinator blend. Steve, do you think that seems reasonable? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any issue with it. 
I mean, I think the best location for it would be up by the road, but that's outside of buffer zone, so that doesn't really do anything for sweetening the pot for for the commission. No, I think that actually does. I mean, you know, the pollinators don't know where the wetlands are. It's no, all, they don't. <laughs> yeah, we're flexible. I mean, we could talk to to the client and see. You know, I, I think she'd probably be amenable to it. You know, there's probably be some areas of this that they're not going to maintain as lawn just because, and you know, they could keep it as a wild meadow. And certainly. Yeah. The area that would be converted to and maintain as pasture it wouldn't would not be lawn, so that would promote some, you know, transition to to flowering habitats as opposed to what it is now. And we also have some fairly standard um, conditions for lawns or those type of areas within buffer zones, so no chemicals and those type of conditions. But seeing that it's pasture, I assume that that wouldn't be done anyways. <clears throat> Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. We have a standard boilerplate for both Wetland Protection Act and um, local bylaw for um, uh, single family homes. So I would advocate that we just include that standard boilerplate as well as the special conditions we noted. That sounds perfect to me. Anything else? Uh, sounds like we have it covered at this point, so I think we're ready for a motion. Do you want me to just run through the conditions so that you guys can just say so moved? That would be beautiful, Aaron. Okay, so I would recommend that um, the commission issue a motion to approve and include the boilerplate language for single-family homes under the Wetland Protection Act and local wetland bylaw that the commission includes special conditions for manure storage outside of the 100 foot buffer zone, um, a condition that pollinator habitat be incorporated in disturbed areas within the buffer zone and outside the buffer zone if possible. Um, boundaries be placed at the pivot points of cleared areas within the buffer zone. Um, I think that's all I have. So moved. Second. Okay. So thank you. So we will go through roll call. Fletcher. Aye. Brett. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Leroy. Aye. So I think we are good. Anything else on this one, Aaron? No, I don't think so. I think we're good to move on. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Let me just change up things here real quick. I think I'm missing somebody. Well, they must have jumped off. Okay. Yeah, you know, some guy okay. Nat was on. Yeah, but I don't see Nat anymore. So I'm not quite sure where he went. Okay. Um, so that means that we're going to move on to our 755, which is a request for determination. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Wetlands Bylaw. This is for um, the property for the highway construction or the highway um, changes. Let's see, how do we want to? How are we referencing this one? I know what we're talking about here, Aaron, but I'm looking for the language for the specific area that we want to reference here, Aaron? Oh, um, I'm sorry. It's Northampton Road between Route 116 and um, University Drive. Perfect. Thank you. I was looking at it earlier, but I spaced on that. So, okay. So for those people who are here for that, if you want to raise your hand and, okay, so I see Brian, uh, I see S. Campbell. Okay, and uh, I see something from MassDOT as well, but uh, we can leave them off unless they so desire. Okay, so um, I'm not quite sure who is presenting, but if you want to introduce yourselves and give a brief introduction, that'd be most appreciated. Sure, how are you doing? Um, I'm Brian Myers from GPI. Um, also with me is uh, Sam Campbell here. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go over just an overview of the project and then um, hand it over to Sam here to, to talk about uh, our work in the, in the buffer zone. So let's see, share screen. There we go. All right, so are you seeing this locust plan here? No. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. It doesn't look like anything's being shared yet. Okay. There we go. There we go. I have to hit the share button. Um, so as you know, this is a mess DOT project. Um, uh, here's, here's a locus. Um, it's um, in, in the red is our project area. You can see it's, it's quite close to the town line here. Um, it's a little less than a mile long. Um, it, it goes from University Drive all the way to, to South Pleasant Street over there. Let's see. Um, here's uh, what we're proposing for our new, our new section. We have two foot, uh, two 11 foot travel lanes um, with two foot, two five foot shoulders um, that'll be striped as, as bike lanes. And then we have um, two th three foot grass strips with five and a half foot um, asphalt sidewalks. The majority of the, the road is gonna be uh, completely reconstructed, so ripped up in, in, in new pavement. Um, we're doing, uh, we're completely replacing the existing uh, drainage infrastructure, as well as uh, doing some upgrades to the, the water lines along the, along the corridor. Um, we have two mid-block crossings, um, one at Hazel Avenue here and one at Orchard Street. These will be um, supplemented with uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. We're also doing uh, some, some work at the intersections as well. Um, the intersection of University Drive, um, geometry won't change much, but we're replacing uh, all of the signal equipment. And a uh, million overlaying the intersection. Uh, this, the intersection to the north, uh, we're just milling and overlaying the intersection and we're actually updating the um, existing pedestrian uh, signals. Um, this will also be uh, changed to uh, video detection for the, uh, for the approaches. Hmm. Um, and now I, I think I'll just turn over to Sam here to talk about our, uh, our work in the buffer zones. Yep, and Brian, if you could just stop screen sharing so that I can share mine. All right, okay. Okay, let's see, let me share screen one. All right, so you're all able to see the same locus map that Brian was pointing out earlier? Yes. Great. So as he mentioned, uh, the project limits extend from approximately the intersection of Route 9 at Northampton Road to the intersection up here. Um, and only a small portion of the project is actually located within the buffer zone. And that portion is uh, at the western end of the project here. So at this point, I'm actually going to open the plans that were submitted with the RDA and reference those. Um, so we are proposing work within the 100 foot buffer zone associated with some small bordering vegetated wetlands, which you can see on the first page of the construction plans here and here, Whoops. as well as the bank to an unnamed intermittent stream that you can see on the second page of the uh, drainage plans here. Um, the total work area within the buffer zone is 25,826 square feet, but of that area, uh, approximately 22,628 square feet is already developed as Route 9. Um, so the increases in impervious area that we're proposing are a result of the uh, proposed sidewalks, five and a half foot sidewalks, on the northern side of the road here, and the 
proposed shared use path on the southern side here. Um, and those improvements are necessary to you know, meet the ADA requirements and improve safety and accessibility throughout the corridor. Mm -hmm. um, additional work within the buffer zone, as Brian mentioned, includes uh, pavement milling and hot mix asphalt overlay. Uh, as I mentioned, construction of those sidewalks, drainage upgrades, including uh, catch basin installations, um, installation of erosion and sedimentation controls to protect those wetlands during construction, um, as well as some work at this outfall, which is adjacent to that unnamed intermittent stream. Uh, during the survey, um, some, basically they identified that the existing outfall is pretty much silted up. So we're just proposing to clean out that silt and then through the installation of deep sump catch basins, uh, resolve that issue in the proposed condition. Um, within the buffer zone, uh, all disturbed, throughout the project limits, all disturbed slopes will be treated with loam and seed upon the completion of construction to stabilize the areas. Um, and I think at this point, it would be best to just turn it over to the commission for any questions. Aaron, I don't know if you have photos or if you'd like me to share the ones that I have. Um, yes, so I, um, if you could share the photos that you have, that would be very useful. I wasn't actually able to get out there today. I ran out of time. And, um, yeah, no and just for reference um, for the Conservation Commission, I know I had mentioned sort of if you guys had time to get out and take a quick ride by. Um, this application was actually submitted after the submittal deadline for this meeting, but um, it just so happened it came in the day I was writing up the legal ad, so I, I kind of piggybacked it on to this meeting just so we could try to get it um, get it rolling and um, because we have so many continuations. So I just wanted to put that out there for sort of perspective on um, why I I threw it on this agenda and also just because um, we we weren't able this morning to squeeze it in on site visits we just ran out of time um, I guess um, while we're looking at site visits I just I have a couple questions because I haven't even had a chance to look at this application yet um, um, and I, this is a general question and I know you know mass DOT has sort of different process than some other applicants, but it sounds like there is impervious area being added in buffer zone, um, additional impervious area. And I was just curious why, um, I mean, it's, it's kind, I guess it's kind of on the fence as far as like a notice of intent versus an RDA, but um, it just, since it looks like impervious is being added, I was just curious why um, an RDA was filed instead of a notice of intent application? Yep. So as I mentioned, the, well, first, so the impervious increase is associated with the installation of um, pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. So, you know, um, areas not intended for any motorized vehicle use. Um, and the decision to file an RDA was just based on some internal conversations with DOT. Um, generally, the thought being that you know, because it's only work within the buffer zone, even though it is resulting in a uh, net increase in impervious area, you know, it wasn't resulting in any impacts to the adjacent wetlands or um, intermittent stream. And so much of the area is already you know, previously developed um, that it wasn't a significant alteration to sort of the existing condition. Um, Brian, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that or no, Rob, okay. if you... Yeah, I mean, and just for perspective sake, like we just required a notice of intent application for adding impervious surface in a, you know, the outer buffer of a turnaround for a small, um, this little school, then they had to put in a um, rain garden and improved drainage um, situation just for that small addition of impervious. So, I mean, it, it's, uh, it sounds logical what you've suggested. I just wanted to make sure that the commission's aware, you know, there's no stormwater management plan associated with this. So long-term, when an order of conditions is issued, typically there's a stormwater management plan that includes things like maintenance of stormwater structures over the long-term to make sure that they're managed properly. But again, you know, it's a, it's a mass DOT project and, and I know 
from working with them in the past that this happens quite frequently. So just, just to see that from both sides. Okay, thank you. Um, any other, so do you wanna go through some of the pictures at this point, Sam? Absolutely, yep. Um, so are you still able to see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, and I'll just say that these photos were also submitted as an appendix with the RDA, so you should have copies if you need to review them any further. Um, but yeah, you see this first photo here, um, you can see this concrete flared end section. This is actually the drainage outfall. Um, and as you can see, it, it's silted up pretty good. Um, so as I mentioned, the project will clean out that outfall and we'll be installing um, deep sump catch basins uh, to address sort of those sedimentation issues. Um, Sorry, where, where is that? Where's this uh, uh, yeah. out, outfall? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm just gonna go back to the plans for just a second. It's this outfall to this yeah. stream here. So this is the existing paved parking lot on private property. Route oh, nine. Yep. Yep. Um, see here, this is just another view of the outfall. This is the stream. This is the vegetated area uh, adjacent to it. You can actually see that parking lot in the background and the outfall is somewhere in there. Again, this is just another view of the stream. So the outfall would be somewhere here and we're looking you know, up towards, away from Route 9 towards that private property. And here's just a, whoops, just another shot of that intermittent stream in the adjacent wetland. Did we, did that wetland, sorry, I'm actually asking the commission now, is that wetland, did that come in front of us for NOI, do some invasive work? Does anybody remember? Is that the one by the um, urgent care center? It is the one by the urgent care center. And I know I've seen it on another delineation. That so it's was, all been delineated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe there is a project going on with that little parking lot. Um, Brian, I know we've done some coordination with them just to make sure that our you know, yeah, they're doing work. some some work at the Cooley Dickinson there. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, there's a, a new curb cut that they're putting actually right there, right where that, right over that pipe. This yeah. area, right? Yeah, right. Right. You can actually see the, the driveway there that they'll be mm -hmm. right. putting in. That's what was... Okay. So how about other commissioners? Are there thoughts or comments? Sorry, can you say again how much of the square footage you're going to put, add to the impervious surface again? Yep, it's going to be approximately 3,200 square feet of impervious surface. And that's bicycle lane sidewalks? Yep. But that's roughly a 10% increase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 12, but yeah. So, I mean, it is a substantial increase in the amount of impervious going in. Uh -huh. And I mean, it, it's for good reason and it's necessary. So that's not the debate, but. Aaron, in your experience um, with this being an RDA instead of an NOI, is there, can we sufficiently condition, were we to decide we would move forward with this in its current form? Can we sufficiently condition to a point where you'd be comfortable mm -hmm with controls on sediment erosion control and stormwater management um, during construction of this increased impervious surface? Or do you think that we need a full-blown stormwater management plan? Yeah, so just for context on that, um, I have no objections to it being issued as a determination, as a determination of applicability. I don't have any issues with that. And um, I think it can be conditioned during construction so that the wetlands are protected. Um, that's not that's not my concern. Um, and also, just for context, I have permitted previously orders of conditions to DOT and also managed orders of conditions for DOT that had stormwater management plans. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were followed. And I think it's it's all a symptom of the state and budgets and things. You know, they do the best they can. They get out there and they clean them when they can. But sometimes even having those 
even when, when we have a stormwater management plan, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're followed to the letter of the plan, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, they, they get out there when they can clean them and they get, do the work when they can. So whether it's an RDA or an order, of, uh, excuse me, whether it's a determination or an order of conditions, I don't think it's gonna change the long-term maintenance or management. It's merely, if there was a problem, like for example, if one of the catch basins started backing up or there was a clear issue with something not being maintained, it's just um, there's a little more teeth for the commission in those instances, I think. But in either case, I think you call DOT and you say, hey, this structure's not being maintained and could you guys get out there and clean it out? It's not any judgment on DOT whatsoever. It's merely just um, you know, a res it's a resource issue, I think. So that's. Yeah. And I wasn't assuming it was a specific problem with DOT. It was more yep. just a general question of how much control yep. we have and what levers we can pull yep. in the like full NOI versus RDA scenario. Yep. But it sounds to me like you feel like we can be in good control in either of those. Yeah. And I think, like I said, just from, you know, they're, they're going to maintain it the way that it, through their maintenance plans, the way that they maintain all of their state roads, um, they're going to follow those procedures regardless um, of whether we have an order of conditions or a determination. So, for example, just because a determination wears out after three years doesn't mean that they're going to stop going out and cleaning out the catch basins or that they're still going to stop doing stormwater maintenance. It just means they're going to be doing that anyways and they're going to be doing it on their own schedule. So, um, I don't have concerns with issuing it as a determination. Um, I just wanted to point out the difference to the board in the permit itself and how it's being issued. So I just wanted to make sure that I was kind of being clear about that. Um, and also be clear about the fact that I haven't been out to see the site. So, but it's, it's completely at you guys discretion. And if you're comfortable with it, um, I've seen many commissions issue approvals based on plan sets like this as determinations, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Robert, you were raising your hand before. I didn't know if you had something that you wanted to add at this point. You're on mute if you do. So, okay. Maybe not. Um, yeah, I gotta admit that I'm a little more comfortable with the NOI versus um, the RDA route. Uh, I understand what you're saying that the, the at the end of the day the difference is not all that great, but yeah, particularly I mean I think part of it is also just that uh, you well, know, we I mean, haven't been out to see this do an NOI on this, so it's kind of strange. Yeah. I mean, so can somebody from the applicant side give me a, a better justification for why an NOI was not? It seems like it was just kind of out of a whim. But I don't know if there is a better reason. Uh, no, I mean, as we discussed, you know, we looked at the scope of the project um, and the proposed work within the buffer zone. Said, you know, despite the increase, this is really, you know, in line with the existing condition, you know, given the development as the roadway. I know we sort of discussed the, the increase in impervious, but again, those areas are, um, you know, not associated with the roadway. They're associated with uh, non-motorized uses, so less potential for, um, you know, pollutant loading, sedimentation from those locations. Um, you know, that's really, and again, just sort of internal discussions. But other than that, I don't, I don't have any, anything else. Yeah, so I appreciate what you're saying about the vehicular travel, but they, it is still obviously increase in impervious. Right. Because deleterious effects and a substantial increase. So. so, I mean, a couple options might be, you know, if we, if we were to continue to the next meeting, it would give us a chance to go out and look at it um, and see, you know, hey, if the areas of increase are relatively minor or in areas that are already, you know, um, you know, they're already degraded, then maybe it would, it would feel less um, impactful to issue the determination. But at the same time, 
I don't want to hold up the process. I don't know what the timeline for getting this completed is. So if it um, makes more um, sense to. I, sorry to cut in. I am a fan of continuing it because I would like to be able to go out there and just look at this. I'm sorry. I know I'm familiar with the area and I did a drive by, but um, I need to like see it again. I also have to go. Um, I'm really sorry, but something's come up. Uh, so I just wanted to say, sorry. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye, Jen. <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Bye, Jen. Yeah, so I mean, I'm okay with the continuation as well. I mean, my oh, only we, problem we is... We don't have a quorum now anyway. Um, no, I think we still have four. Oh, we do? Yep. Well, the, the oh, other yeah, benefit... Leroy. The other benefit of continuing is that we can have two additional commission members be a part of the discussion who can view the proceeding and, and you'll have additional folks to vote on it and visit the site before the next meeting. My only concern is if we continue it for another two weeks, which again, I'm fine with, and then at that point we decide that this needs to go to an NOI route, that's just going to delay things longer versus going down the NOI route at this point seeing that we're not gonna be able to continue, we're not gonna vote on this tonight anyways. I mean, so is there a lot of additional work from the applicant side to put this in as an NOI? Is there objections on your side for that? Well, I could tell you um, at the direction we're taking right now. Um, so we'll be submitting 100% plans, I'm sorry, ps &E plans um, in the next couple months. And then it's, it's um, the rest of the work is kind of just, there's a lot of abutting properties and a lot of easements that need to, need to be uh, worked on. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes quite a bit of time. It's uh, scheduled to be advertised um, in uh, March, March of 2021. Okay. Which to me sounds like that's far away, but in, maybe it's not. <laughs> yeah, the, um, it's uh, again, it's those uh, what takes the, uh, that, that huge amount of time is, is knocking on every door, right? And then telling them what, what, what we're doing to those, those property, what we're doing to their land, and, and everything has to be set uh, before that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should ask the applicant what they would prefer to do. If you would prefer a continuation to add additional folks um, to the, you know, voting um, mm -hmm. block and and kind of consider the RDA, or if you'd prefer the board to take a vote on it this evening and. Um, well, I don't think I'm comfortable voting this evening, um, either way. But just kind of if we want to take. You Are you know, saying because this. Brett, you asked, you're saying that because you, you want NOI? That's my personal predilection, yes. Well, I, if you voted a positive, is the point I'm making, is if you voted a positive, Brett, it would, it would mean that they would have to file a notice okay. of intent. If you said okay. that it was a positive, then, then that's the direction they would have to go in. Okay, thank you, Aaron. So, Robert, you wanted to chime in? Robert, are you there? I see his hand raised. He's not muted, but. Hmm. Rob, if you can hear, maybe try the call in number from the phone as opposed to the. Oh, yeah, he might not have a mic on his um, yeah, mine's, computer. Mine can be a bit uh, iffy, too, so I know what he's <laughs> probably dealing with. We do have somebody, a couple people. We have one person on the phone, but I don't know who that is. Uh, so um, also, oh wait, I guess we don't have a comment. We don't, we don't have the ability to type up comments. Um, so I'm going to unmute. Um, so I just unmuted the person who's on the phone. Is that Robert who's on the phone? That is me on the phone. Okay, now we can hear you. So now we're good. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, do we have Robert? time? Do we have time to go back to a couple of the comments or... Mm -hmm. Or or no? Now we're yes. here. Thank you so much. I um, I I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, I've tried to chime in a couple of times, but excuse me for the technical difficulties. Um, 
so yeah, the, um, so thanks for discussing the project. And um, from my perspective, the, the project um, incorporates some impervious increases impervious within the buffer zone. And overall, it, it's, it's, if you look at it overall, I know we've got the microscope zo zoomed in, which is great. And I, I'm happy to talk about that. But if you look at it overall, it, the increases in impervious is minimal for what this could have been. Um, so I, I consider it as avoiding and minimizing, right? Uh, as two, two of the three prongs of uh, avoiding impacts and minimizing impacts and work within buffer zones and riverfront area and resource areas. Uh, so th that was completed and that was done uh, and discussed and reviewed again and again and again. So it wasn't just something we just, Hey, we're going to, we're going to increase things and just go and go and go. Um, so we avoided, we minimized, we, we, we reduced, we're providing, um, you know, travel way for all vehicles and all pedestrian types. So I'll keep it short. So yes, there's an increase in pervious within the buffer zone and um, if you think about um, all the different raindrops that are going to fall within that buffer zone and within the areas contributing the water to that wetland in that buffer zone, the percentage that falls within the highway layout is managed within the curbing and within those um, catch basins, which if there's older catch basins in place, those will be upgraded to deep sump catch basins. Um, the new curbing and new uh, pavement will add to that management, that efficiency of the management of stormwater. And uh, in my opinion, the the um, function of water in that area, in that buffer zone, and in areas contributing to the buffer zone are going to be um, almost identical as before and after the project due to the the uh, curbing in place and the deep sump catch basin. So, and just to throw numbers at, at you before, as I wrap up, your average deep sump catch basin with a four foot or greater sump has upwards of three, uh, capacity of 300 gallons of water, which is significant. Um, so if we're talking, of, again, if we're talking about that area of the project within the buffer zone, and, you, and let's not forget the stormwater management that's in place and the hundreds of gallons that's being um, retained, letting allowing sediment to fall out and then uh, slowly discharging out to that wetland. So that it, that's going to function basically the same that it is today. Um, that's my opinion, of course, but uh, I'm happy to continue to discuss this in wh whatever shape you want to discuss it in whatever way you're uh, comfortable discussing with it. Thanks. Thanks for letting me go out ramble on. Yeah. And so Robert, can you um, either verify or add on to what Sam was saying as a rationale between a RDA and an NOI? Um, you know, I mean, in my mind, it just feels very, uh, I don't know if unjust is the right word, but unjust to do this as an RDA versus some of these other much smaller projects we're putting through as NOIs. I mean, so I heard what you uh, said, a, and you think it's minimal, and that's not the issue on my end, per se. Oh, no, I, I, I and I, um, I can clearly see the, the uh, tipping of the scales, if you will, and your, your perspective of it and things like that. Um, so a couple of things. Um, we don't, you know, GPI, Mass DOT, all the people involved, there's, there's no um, preconceived concept of what, what the permitting is going to be and to, trying to avoid one level or the other. The, the concept always is to do what's the best thing for each, each very unique situation. Um, and, you know, was, was um, sidewalk and pedestrian and bicycling improvements required in this area? And the answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what can we do 
what resource areas are there. This is from step one. This is before the ink hits the paper. What can we do to minimize, mitigate, uh, mm -hmm. and avoid? Um, one of the answers is, is that those resource areas are set back from the roadway. Uh, they're not within the layout. There's not, there, we don't have kind of, let's say a 10 acre parcel where, where we can pick and choose and say, okay, the driveway is going to go here. The building's going to go there. We, unfortunately we're, we're, we're kind of cut out of that scenario. We don't usually ever really usually have that scenario. So we're, we're very limited to where, where we can put things based on, we don't want to impact people's uh, right to their private property and, uh, as well as to the discharge of, of, of that water. Uh, so we had to work within those parameters, which is very strict. Um, so what can we do within, you know, within what we're proposing and with regards to resource areas and what's protection act. And as we, as we discussed it a number of times, uh, there's anywhere, I think a minimum of five to six to seven people on the discussions. Um, I, you know, I was never really, um, of, of the feeling for me, my personal opinion that this was elevated to, uh, a notice of intent and to be really, um, specific to the Weapons Protection Act, the only thing that really brought me to thinking notice of intent or, or impact, direct impact, or increasing uh, of some, uh, what could be perceived as disturbance or in change or impact to the resource areas would be uh, the cleaning of the sediment, which actually, actually is an improvement. So that was really the the removal of the sediment was the only thing that I visualized uh, as like an oversight person when this is under construction as, okay, what could be considered as an impact in these resource areas? And that was the one thing that I thought of. Actually, the work, again, just in my humble opinion, the work itself, I did not see as a significant change. It, I, I thought it was very minor, actually, to the amount of water that comes down through that area which is tens and tens of thousands of square feet, again, which is managed by the stormwater management system. So I think that the increase for the sidewalks, whether it was sidewalk or whether it was for the, on the highway itself, I think it is not changing as it, as it meets that wetland area. So that's, I can only speak for myself, but being part of those meetings from, from, uh, from day one before pen was even put to paper, I, again, the only thing I really thought of as far as notice of intent was that sediment work, which again is uh, really um, an improvement to start back uh, with a nice clean out, you know, all file. Mm -hmm. um, I'm okay. not sure what else I could, what could say on that part. Okay, so that's helpful, Robert. So thank you. Um, I hear you, you know, I'll need to kind of sleep on that. I'm not, I'm not um, particularly swayed at this point. Um, I still think an NOI is, you know, at least my preferred rep. I'm just one person here. Um, and so we have a couple of different options that we have. Um, and so first, uh, I just want to see, there's somebody else from the public. Um, John Osorio, did you have anything you wanted to say? If you did, you can just raise your hand and uh, if not, we'll kind of keep going. Oh, okay, yeah, so um, John, you should be able to talk now. Uh, good evening, uh, John Osorio, GPI. Um, I, I was just really listening in, listening in and um, I mean, I, I don't have too much more to add, but to, and I, I believe Aaron mentioned that there's a possibility of, uh, I thought I understood adding conditions to the RDA, so if that's, I'm not sure that we're going to get much more different uh, results from the notice of intent. Uh, I think she pointed out that MassDOT has their uh, maintenance program that they pretty much follow for all of their state highways. Um, so, it, you know, to maybe not delay things. So I, I understand that this would probably get continued. You, you know, those folks that want to go perform their, the site visit, which is understandable. Um, but I, if we're leaning towards the notice of intent, 
we would rather know that earlier, um, you know, and if it can be done prior to the next meeting, because it would take us a little bit of time to get ready for a notice of intent. Uh, there's a stormwater report that needs to get prepared. Again, I don't think it's going to give us much of a different outcome. Um, but if there's certain conditions that can be added to this RDA, then we would be happy to take a look at those and talk to Mass DOT about that. So that's all I want to, to say. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. And I'm not sure that, yeah, the difference is, I mean, I think there's some permanence differences in some other pieces. Um, it's also just precedent. Um, truthfully. Right. Totally understood. So. Yeah, um, and that's why I was trying to deal with this tonight. So if there's other people who feel strongly about the NOI, so if Larry or um, Leroy or Fletcher, if you feel strongly about that, now would be the time to, you know, pipe in about that. If not, we can punt until next time. Um, this is not a closed issue, so we will have to bring it up again. But if there is strong feeling, we can deal with it tonight. But if not, um, if I'm the only one, which is perfectly fine, um, let's just continue. You mean continue as a positive RDA? Uh, continue the discussion until next. Or just continue week. it, clear because clearly um, Jen wasn't ha wasn't feeling it either. I'm okay with it. I am. My thing is the precedent. Like, like Aaron just said, we just had somebody do an NOI for the common school there. But the fact that Mass DOT has their stormwater management plan already in place and their scheduling in place, I'm not. That's where I'm. I, I'm not too worried about it. But clearly, we're not. Clearly, this is going to get continued, so we could just. Um, sounds like Brett and Jen want an NOI. So I don't care about Jen. Jen at least wanted to do a site visit. I didn't really get her feeling on. Oh, NOI. sorry. That, I don't mean to speak for her. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Fletcher about the idea that that uh, I don't like the precedent issue as well. But I also realized in this case with the state and the DOC, they're already they're already accomplishing some of these things separately. So I'm I'm comfortable, perhaps, but I don't like the idea of the uh, uh, the change in precedent. Yeah, can we just put that in our conditions? <laughs> Is there any way that we could get a copy of like the Mass DOT stormwater, like statewide stormwater plan, just so that the commission could feel more comfortable with kind of what your statewide management plan is for um, catch basins and detention basins and street sweepings and things like that? that uh, truthfully, uh, it's not going to help me that much. I understand those in general, and I'm sure that their um, budget, as long as the budgets are there, they're going to do a good job. So then what, what, what Fletcher said was, can we, can we put something in here that effectively makes it like that? It's already, it's already there. It's there. It's already there. They well, have a plan. It's, it's, it seems like we're at a bit of an impasse, to be honest. Um, I, I feel like maybe we should schedule a site visit before the next meeting. And then if, if, the, if the applicant is in favor, maybe we could just do a continuation and take it up with a fuller complement of board members to make a decision. Okay, yeah, again, that's fine by me. I was just hoping to, if we did want to go the NOI to speed it up for the applicant, that's what I was trying to do. So um, yeah, Robert, you had a comment? Oh yes, thanks Thanks for giving me another chance to chime in. And um, you know, I'm, absolutely willing to work with GPI and the commissioners to, to provide whatever information is needed. Uh, if, if Aaron, as Aaron mentioned, if some of the um, maintenance schedules, information, examples, different, and, and even, even specific information to that uh, stretch of highway would be, um, beneficial to the conversation. I'm more than happy to, to uh, put that together. I'm more than happy to meet with you and GPI out on site or whatever, whatever sites are available. Uh, we don't really have access to private property per se, but whatever we can see from, from those side of the highway, side of the roadway areas, um, it, it definitely um, as much time as you want to spend out there, I would, Going back, you know, beauty is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So 
I'm going to say this just again, just with my humble opinion, as far as uh, precedent being set personally, I don't see within the wetlands protection act and I'm going to be, um, I hope, I hope this isn't an offensive to anybody in any way, but I don't see an impact. Um, so as far as the wetlands protection act goes, or even, um, bylaws, um, I don't, I don't see there being, uh, any increase, any impacts to wetlands. I see there, are, I see a direct benefit to wetlands with, with the sediment removal, which I think we're going a, a little bit, you know, off the beaten path, you will to make that improvement. I don't see any, um, you know, you know, negative, uh, water quality type situation or removal of uh, canopy, removal of vegetation, change of vegetation. Yes, there is increase in impervious. Uh, but again, with the hundreds of thousands and tens and tens of thousands of uh, square footage of impervious within the project that's coming down into that buffer zone from one way or direction or another, including from other areas not within the highway layout, I think that the stormwater water management system in place is more than adequately um, containing it, detaining it, and then gently out, outletting it. And I don't, and I honestly, and with knowledge of the area, uh, can say that that discharge is not changing. So I don't, I don't, I don't feel that there is an impact, but I completely under, uh, am open to whatever the commissioners feel. And if we, if we have to go one or the other site visit, another meeting, whatever it takes to, uh, for everyone to feel comfortable with it, that's the ultimate goal really is for everyone to have enough information that they can decide it one way or the other. Uh, so thanks again for letting me ramble on. I appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I mean, so we're going to need a site visit one way or the other. Um, you know, so I hear from the applicant side, they're very comfortable with the RDA. Um, that's their prerogative. Um, that's not where I am. That's my prerogative. Um, so, you know, so it comes down to the other, you know, members of the commission. So Larry, Leroy, Fletcher, are you guys comfortable voting tonight? Do you want to wait till we have a site visit? I would rather wait. I'm pretty actually comfortable with the site. Uh... Okay. I'm I'm almost wanting to vote just to again African students be willing to go the NOA route and students rather than later. But I'm very willing to wait. We can all go see. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to see it. Have a good site visit. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we do that? Um, so we'll basically table the discussion for now. Um, so as long as the applicant is okay tabling or um, continuing for two weeks. And can you give us a date for that, Erin, and a time? Yes, so it will be um, June 10th at 8 p.m. And from the applicant's perspective, that's okay? Yeah, that works for us. That works. Okay, yep, and so then we'll have a better chance to look at this property or this area. I'm very familiar with it, so I'm okay. I actually don't need the site visit. I'll, I'll go out if I can, but um, I know it a little too well. Um, but yeah, and then we can have this other discussion. Hopefully, yeah, next time we will hopefully have a broader group of people of commissioners who will be here as well. So we would just need a motion to continue yeah. it. Let's go, Larry. Um, <laughs> okay, so Fletcher, your vote. Aye. Me, aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Okay, so we are continued. So thank you, everyone. We will see you in about two weeks. Thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay, so I am just switching up the attendee list here. Attendee. Uh, looks like they are all, oh, we have one more. Okay. Okay, so um, 
that was the last thing that was officially on the agenda. Um, Pine Grove, we already dealt with, Aaron. Yes. Yep. Um, deal with tonight? I just wanted to let you guys know that there was some invasives pulling being done on um, the bike path by DCR. Um, that was that's being done this week. So there are people out pulling invasives um, off of the, the bike path. Um, <clears throat> And I've been following the monitoring reports, nothing really to report there. I do, I am a little behind on site visits and returning calls to people, but I'm, you know, crossing, I'm crossing them off my list as I'm able to. It's just been uh, very busy and lots of calls. So that's, that's about all I have to report. Do what you gotta do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, the bike trail, that's just garlic mustard type stuff or are they doing yeah, bigger stuff? Yeah, they're focused on garlic mustard, yep. Okay, that's minor. I mean, it's nasty, but that's not as impactful as some of the bigger stuff. Yeah. That's okay. all I have. Okay, so thank you. Any other thing that the commissioners want to talk about? And if not, we're looking for a motion for closure. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. So, okay, so I vote <laughs> aye. Um, Larry? <laughs> Fletcher? Aye. Oh, wait, Larry, I don't think I heard you. Aye. Okay, I don't think we need to. So, Roy? Aye. Kind of a silly thing to vote on, but got to do it. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, Bye, guys. Hopefully, I'll Thanks. be able to make some of the site visits um, in two weeks, Aaron. That sounds good. I don't think we're going to, we're probably going to have only that one. I think maybe we'll go out and see Tofino, too, but I'll, I'm still working on that. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Let me know if there's anything I can do, Aaron. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks guys. Aaron. Take okay. care. Bye-bye.